Okay, so I think you should be able to see that it's recording on your end. You should see something. Maybe it just shows at the top of the screen or something. Um, it's kind of odd because I don't see any notification. Hmm. But Yeah, that's, that's weird because I, I thought it did. But anyway, it, it should. It says that it's recording, so you should be able to get the video that it produces, and then you can extract audio from the video or do whatever you want with it or just upload the video. Okay. All right, yeah, cool. Sounds um, good. Yeah, I enjoyed some of your recent videos, and I, I, I mean, this is a bit, I guess this is a bit tangential, but uh, I sort of find it interesting that you seem to be kind of reconsidering liberalism and globalism, you know, which, <laughs> well, it, it, which is sort of in line with my views because I've, I've always jokingly said that I was a liberal globalist, uh, you know, half jokingly, half seriously. Because there are these big problems, uh, you know, in the world, so we do need some kind of global governance. Right. And liberalism at its core is a commitment to rationality. It may fall short of that ideal, but, you know, it has that ideal embedded in it. And I think that is a, well, really the only kind of lasting foundation for a functioning civilization especially now that we have opened up so many Pandora's boxes, right? Like, and I guess this is where we really differ is, uh, you know, the role of religion or how we go forward as a species, you know, can we go forward in a sort of religious way or do we have to, uh, well, not be religious, I guess. That's my view, right? Like I'm not, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm speaking for you here and I should let you, voice your own views so yeah what just tell me a bit about your your kind of thoughts on liberalism and globalism and how they might have changed yeah sure well i've actually been a globalist since oh i don't know like 2017 um although spiritually speaking yes we do disagree i think spiritual liberalism individualism has deficits but those deficits can be pointed out with rationality with reason and just pointing to our evolutionary conditioning and saying people need these kinds of identitarian structures collective uh, identities to part participate in and if they don't have them then there are all these maladies that we see so i don't know exactly where that would differ from your position um, but when it comes to the more metaphysical aspects of my spirituality yeah obviously we do disagree there but the whole argument for some kind of global governance stemming from shared uh, externalities, the possibility of you know an asteroid strike, it'd be nice to be able to collaborate globally on that sort of thing. If global climate change uh, turns out to be a serious consideration, I'm kind of agnostic on that point, but there are all sorts of things that only a global government could respond to. Um, the, for me, the chief argument is really though the development of technology uh, Nick Bostrom uses this analogy, which I thought was very good, that we keep on inventing technologies and in a sense we're pulling these balls out of a hat that we can't see into. We don't know what the upshot of these technologies will be until we develop them and see them applied. And so we keep on pulling these balls out, just hoping that everything's going to work out. And we don't know when some breakthrough technology will have devastating consequences that are unforeseen. And so as long as there are multiple states multiple research programs working on different cutting edge things like AI or wherever the danger comes from, eventually we're likely to hit upon some kind of existential threat unless we coordinate technological development at a global scale. I don't know if you agree with that aspect of globalism, but it just seems well, yeah. that's the only huh. solution. No, no, no. I totally, I mean, well, nuclear weapons are a good example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we're, Technology is is evolving on its own without any top-down direction, right? It's not like we have a plan for how we're going to use the technology. Uh, it emerges through market forces and individual innovation, and that's that's fine. I agree with markets and individual innovation, but we also need that top-down plan of what we are going to do as a species. We can't just assume that, you know, we, hey, we just generate all sorts of technology and everything is just going to work out. Right. Um, and it's kind of ironic that a lot of the people with romantic inclinations, like Heidegger fans, are against technology, but they're for political nationalism. 
And how how can you possibly prevent technology from dehumanizing us unless you do have that global aspect? Yeah, well, it's a romantic ideal. They, they're just rejecting technology because it's it's taking us away from nature or some earlier state that they have romanticized. And then also uh, globalization is taking us away from this earlier, you know, romantic ideal that never really existed. But so I think that's why they they have that that view. But um, yeah, I, I agree. It's very unfortunate that globalism has gotten wrapped up in this Alex Jones conspiracy theory um you know new world order illuminati thing and you know you can't um you can't really talk about it without people getting triggered and shutting down uh, rationality and just uh you know reacting emotionally against it right and And, uh and it puts the nationalist also at a strategic disadvantage because if you have the conversation about a global order then you have some influence on how that global order can turn out, even if it is preserving national identities to the greatest extent possible. But if you refuse to engage in any kind of discourse about how the world as a whole should turn out, then you have globalists interfering in national politics, but the nationalists can never influence the globalists. You're just going to get whatever you get. If you refuse to act into history, history will not refuse to act onto you. Right. So... Yeah, you're 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 kind of screwed if you just pretend that you can just squirrel yourself away in a little corner of the world and ignore the rest of the world. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, the Chinese are going to keep going forward. So, yeah, no, I agree, and I think that the the question is what is the global order that you want, and how can you bring that about? And a global order can include uh, quite separate, and it should, I think, include separate units that are, you know have a lot of independence. Like, I don't believe in some kind of global communism, which is what they're usually presenting it as, right? Some kind of great flattening of the world. And it's all McDonald's and strip malls and stuff. And it's all American culture, but everybody's, you know, sort of brown, um, African, Asian hybrid or something. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be like that, right? That's just a kind of straw man, uh, uh, boogeyman used to scare people. Although... Uh, we are kind of heading in that direction. So right. anyways, I just thought that was interesting. And your thoughts on, on liberalism uh, in that video about, you know, it wasn't really about Locke, but um, what was it titled? Have you even read Locke? Yeah, it was to the post-liberal community, which is really seems pre- predominantly this one Discord server and a network of blogs associated with it. They're coming partly out of Neo Reaction. Uh, but it, they seem to reject the possibility of political entities coming about partly by means of that formation of a social contract through the negotiation of essentially rational agents. The, mm. the nature of language automatically means that some big man will occupy the center through his charisma and some kind of ineffable characteristic uh, that just, I guess, directs the attention and discipline of those involved in this discourse, and that's just essentially the nature of linguistic community, sociality, and uh, and so political structures will just have to reflect this. But there's something paradoxical in the fact that they are putting this forward as a rational hypothesis. Right. So, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I totally, I, I make this point a lot, that the critics of rationality are already committed to rationality by the fact that they're critiquing it. So they it's another one of these things where you don't really have a choice, right? You can let let things just happen, but then you have to shut up, basically. Because, you, you know, the minute you start uh, critiquing rationality or making these arguments, you're already committing to rationality. You're in the context where you're saying, okay, here, we have to rationally uh, make these judgments, you know, consciously, critically make them. We can't just allow them to be made subconsciously or intuitively or whatever Mm -hmm. actually what is your what is your uh view of rationality what is your definition of rationality or i mean i'm not saying you have to have yeah well there are several levels obviously the metaphysical level um is basically the psr principle of sufficient reason which is just a statement that any object necessarily has a reason for its being and so reason is just baked into the nature of of physical mm. reality as it is. So this is a but, metaphysical principle that underlies your understanding of human rationality. 
Uh, yeah, well, it, it kind of strengthens the argument for holding people to having a reason for any proposition they put forward. In discourse, I would hold to a rational discussion is one in which anything that you say uh, you necessarily have the obligation, it's accepted that you have the obligation of providing the reason underlying that claim. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think, well, I, I, I would say that, or are you done or is there more? I mean, that's kind of a simplified version of it, but the, yeah, there's that metaphysical aspect where everything in reality uh, can be taken to have a reason for its being exactly what it is. And in human rationality, I think we should have social etiquette where we accept that anything you say, you have an obligation to provide its ground, you know, where are you getting this from? Okay. But then so, the, well, the obvious problem with that is the infinite regress of justification and I guess in the, uh, in nature causality or, um, I don't know, uh, explanation, Right. You have a like if you tried to give a justification for everything you you claim, then, of course, you would necessarily just go back along an infinite regress. Right. And eventually arrive at some ground that you can't justify. Uh, right. Which would lead to the kind of metaphysics underlying um, my spiritual worldview, where it's a variant of Aristotle's argument, the cosmological argument there has to be an uncaused cause or a necessary being or something that's not contingent. And so, I mean, that's ultimately where all lines of justification would terminate. And, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with something like Pythagoreanism or traditional Neoplatonism, but the whole idea is that the universe can be viewed as a mathematical structure. And so mm -hmm. from this undifferentiated, the one, however you want to term it, this kind of uncaused cause, we can, through various sorts of, uh, you know, extrapolations out of that, using the emanationist system in the Neoplatonic schools, or using uh, the kind of tetractus from Pythagoreanism, or none of these are really foolproof. And really, you'd have to go to like the foundations of mathematics, and ultimately like the metallurgical laws to arrive at a first unfolding out of this uh, given necessary being. How you can then through some kind of mathematical process, arrive at any higher order structure. Uh, but in principle, the idea is that every every statement can be drawn back to that ultimate necessity, and we can see according to the laws of logic how it, it comes to be. Now, the problem there will be justifying the, the fact of logical entailment or justifying the metallurgical laws, the law of identity, uh, you can't, or justifying like the principle of sufficient reason itself. Um, which is right at some point impossible. you're gonna arrive at metaphysical assumptions right yeah yeah and i think there's a parsimonious metaphysical system this kind of neoplatonic system uh leading back to this notion of a simplicity or an undifferentiated uh that i don't know lends itself to a kind of mathematical realism uh information reductionalism there's all sorts of different strains that can point to the same conclusion, but uh, I don't know, I think it all fits into my basic worldview. Um, but yeah, there is a problem there where can you justify the principle of sufficient, sufficient reason? Is there a sufficient reason for the PSR itself? It would seem that you have to engage in some kind of circular reasoning to get to that level. Um, right, right. I mean, at, at best, what you could do is you make these assumptions and then you show a posteriori that they aren't uh, well, that they're coherent and that maybe you can self you can justify within you can justify them within the frame that uh, is defined by them. But that's not the same. I mean, I, you know, the thing is, you can never get outside of some frame and say, now I have arrived at this ground. Uh, I won't say truth, but you know, indubitable propositions that you have to accept because they're, you can't not accept them. Right. right? I, mean, I think the cogito shows there's nothing you, you can't question except your own existence. And so... But even there, I mean, you are bringing in the metallurgical laws. I mean, for me, it seems like the, the most fundamental, unquestionable thing will be the law of identity. Because when you say, I think 
therefore I am, you already assume that the I there adheres to this kind of A equals A principle that the I is the I and it's not not the I. True, you true. Know? No, no, no. Yeah, I know. You can't really, even there, there are assumptions or metaphysical assumptions baked into that. And that and that phrasing is a little bit misleading. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think the best way to think about it is you can't really doubt, you can doubt your own existence in various ways, like, because you'd always be in a frame when you doubt it. You'd always be, you know, imagining something else is going on, like imagining your brain in a vat or imagining you're dreaming or imagining you're insane or something like that, right? Um, so the ability to doubt doesn't require that you get outside a frame. You can be in a frame and doubt the frame itself. Um, but there, even the act of doubting implies certain kinds of logical relations, like, again, that law of identity. The fact that I am doubting means that the, the doubting itself as an activity adheres to this principle of identity. Um, and I think you can actually make a strong argument for the ability to make absolute truth claims using the cogito in saying, so, you know, what are we really claiming with the cogito mm-hmm. that I exist? Well, when I say that I exist, I at the same time am saying that reality as a whole is predicated by, you know, containing my existence. And so when we say I necessarily exist, we're saying it's something about reality as a whole. And that to me would be an absolute truth claim. And it's, you know, the self evidence of it stems from the recognition that you know, Descartes kind of points to there that we can't really practically get outside of the fact of our own doubting of our own perception. Um, and so I think that kind of, yeah, gives I, evidence I don't think, for. Hmm. Well, I don't know that you can really, I mean, I think Descartes, like right after he did that, at least if I remember correctly, I read this a long time ago. I think it's the meditations, right? Is it the meditations where he has the yeah. armchair experiment? And then doesn't he almost immediately afterward just jump to a bunch of unjustified assumptions about God and the nature of reality and all this that don't really. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I don't know that you can really base any positive claim on it, on uh, the cogito. Because it's to me, it's more of just a sort of um, feeling almost like it's it's not really a. I don't think you can turn it into some set of metaphysical claims. It's more like even if you you could doubt your own existence, right? It's just that by doing that, you would render yourself absurd. You would put yourself into a paradoxical situation, a state of confusion, and then there would be no meaning to the statement, I doubt my own existence. And that's really, to me, what it means is that you've arrived at this fundamental paradox that lies at the core of existence or subjectivity. It's not that you can ba- – it's not a foundation. It's more of a awareness. It's more of a experiencing the paradox directly. Um, right. But the whole idea is that saying that we are experiencing the paradox directly implicates the metalogical laws. Every, I think any I statement saying it, yes, about, but I'm saying you can't even – that's why I'm saying it's more of a feeling. It's more of an experience because you can't then even claim I am experiencing the paradox – that itself is not, it doesn't follow from the experience, right? It's, uh, well, it, I don't think it's a propositional thing. I think Descartes put it into this formula that is a bit misleading because really it's more just you're, you become aware of your situation as a conscious being that you don't have a foundation. That's to me what it is. It's not a foundation itself. You come to this view that you don't have a foundation, but that view itself, it, is not something is can it, well, but end it's up not, being a foundation. But it's not something that you even know, right? It's just something that you feel, because you, you like you could be wrong. It could be that this this armchair thought experiment that leads to the cogito is just a crazy person, and they're you know you're you're insane. Right? You could be insane, and the the cogito might be wrong. But the thing is, when you contemplate it you're contemplating the abyss. So to me, it's more about the contemplation of the abyss than it is any kind of positive foundation. And I think to go beyond it requires that you make choices, that you just say, well, I'm going to believe this. And then maybe later, if I believe this, I can justify it a posteriori. 
but I don't think it provides you with a foundation. Even if there are necessary presuppositions to the cogito, it still doesn't give you a foundation. Um, hmm. This is pretty, I mean, this is pretty uh, deep. This is deeper than I thought we were going to get. <laughs> we've, well, we've gotten there the question quickly. is, is there a ground for rationality or not? And well, I, yeah, I would say, well, what well, do you mean by a ground, though? I guess... Like, is there such a thing as indubitable certainty, like Descartes thinks? Because I think what you can extrapolate from the thought process involved in the cogito, and really the the fault in the formulation of the cogito is the assumption of this kind of unified ego. It's built into the grammar of cogito ergo sum that there is an I that is engaged in thinking. So it's basically assuming an Aristotelian arrangement of you know, an immaterial substance engaged in this this accidental act of, of thought. And that that's not, you know, necessarily something we can assume that the, the kind of metaphysical statements about the, the nature of the breakdown of the thinking process into subject and object well, is... Well, right. Yeah, right. but... But, but, but well, the then you sort of demonstrated point, the... Mm-hmm. Well, then you've sort of demonstrated that you can still doubt even the presuppositions of... Uh, is it cogito? I'll say cogito, so we're not saying it differently. I don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced. In classical Latin is supposed to be cogito, I guess, but uh, cogito is Latin. Cogito like, actually sounds Latin. better to an English speaker. Anyway, yeah. the yeah. So I think what you're demonstrating though is that you can doubt those assumptions, those presuppositions of the cogito, right? That uh, you can even doubt the I. You, you may right. not be able to dispense with it, but you can doubt it, right? You can no, say, well, what yeah, does that totally, mean? You totally can. Any given entity can be redrawn in different ways, which kind of points to this basic experience involved in the act of doubting, transcending the particular self-concept or concept of particular objects. Uh, We can be wrong about particular applications of the PSR in experience, but there's kind of a meta-level ground, I think, to metalogical claims of identity of non-contradiction because the fact that that experience of doubting is happening itself can't be denied like we can't deny the fact that we're doubting it's impossible to well you 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 can but it's absurd i think no i i think we sort of agree but maybe terminology is a little bit different You, you can doubt that you're doubting as a particular kind of act but you can't doubt that there, you know, there's a process going on before, you know, the witness of consciousness or however you want to phrase it. Yeah, all of these categories that we draw describing the subject object duality can be themselves doubted. But the fact of the engagement in it can't. And I think it, the, it logically entails that reality as a whole contains that because it can't be doubted. And so already using this kind of ground, I think we can. Uh, find justification for certain kinds of basic principles that must apply to reality as a whole. Well, the justification would be <clears throat> that you can't escape from it, so you're stuck with it. It's not so much that you can't doubt it, but that you can't get outside of it, right? Like if you, like, what is rationality? Rationality is just the way you think, and rationality is like a set of boundaries on thought. You know, like, I cannot really believe a contradiction. I might be able to have contradictory beliefs in my head somewhere, but if I bring them both into consciousness at the same time, they will sort of destroy. Well, one of them will be destroyed or they will both be destroyed, right? I can't have that contradiction in my mind because my mind just won't contain it, right? So in a way, rationality is mapping out the boundaries, the experientially mapping out the boundaries of my subjective freedom um now nobody is is forced to like agree with you when you map these boundaries out but um they might find that they have the same boundaries experientially right as you could say well you can't believe a contradiction they might go and say oh let's see if i can do that and find it impossible to do that um yeah so is it is it a law of thought or is it a an, an absolute law though these kind of logical principles. Um, We can argue a posteriori from the parsimony of an account of their their kind of metaphysical fundamentalness um, in that 
all of our descriptions of physical reality automatically imply the metalogical laws. Mathematics is based on logic. Logic is based on these basic, unalterable seeming laws of thought. We certainly can't think outside of them, but it's not just that our kind of rational descriptions of the world are bound to them. It's that there's, there's simply no account of the world that's possible that doesn't at all times obey this uh you know psr most generally well but that's an account and so like we can't get outside of our representations we can't get at the world itself to you know i mean what you're talking about are if you say any representation is going to obey these laws of thought that's because it's representation and the laws of thought are you know laws of representation or boundaries on what we can represent but we can't say that those are boundaries that apply to reality because we can't say anything about reality except by using representations, right? So we can't know mm-hmm. that. That's, the, that's Kant's argument for the, the phenomenal noumenal distinction, right? So the phenomenon is our representation and the laws of thought apply there. His transcendental aesthetic applies there. The categories of the understanding apply there. But the noumenal world beyond our representation, well, we we aren't really justified in making any claims about it. But the problem with that, and Chris Langan points this out, is that any way of talking about the noumenal will Mm -hmm. automatically presuppose that it has some kind of relation to the phenomenal. And therefore, we're presupposing some kind of underlying common syntax between the phenomenal and noumenal. So like we can't, the closest we can get at basically in talking about something that doesn't obey the PSR, something beyond our experience is chaos. But whenever Mm -hmm. we articulate that concept at the same time, it it, it It, is circumscribed by the law of identity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's just... Well, no, I know. But I think the way to... well, the way I would think about that is that we're trapped in subjectivity. And so whatever uh, the rules of subjectivity are, those are going to appear to be the rules of objectivity because we have no alternative to them. I don't think that proves anything about objectivity, but our existence suggests, you know, empirically suggests that objectivity is, you know, is not... Like, if, if objectivity, if we had no knowledge of of reality, then all would be chaos. And the fact that all is not chaos means that our knowledge of the world is knowledge of something. You know, it's, again, that's an experiential thing. We experience surprise when we are wrong, but we also experience, uh, you know, correct prediction as in, oh yeah, I knew that was going to happen. So we, we have those different feelings and the best way to make sense of them is to assume that there's an you know an external world that we are capable of having knowledge of in some sense um anyway i don't know what i think we might be going too far off into metaphysics or whatever you want to call it um, well the question is rationality and it's connected to liberalism because as you said like liberalism is kind of the assumption that we're going to engage in rational discourse thoroughly that you know, when we build political structures, we're going to use reason to do it. We're not going to use raw power politics or charisma or some right. seemingly irrational force. Um, and I think this question of like, what's the foundation of, of rationality? Well, Is it a pragmatic decision? And that like, well, I can't seem to think around it, so I'll just choose to assume it. Um, that I think we are disagreeing in that I, there's simply no alternative to an ordered world that we can entertain. And so when you say it's just an assumption, it's like, no, there's there's simply nothing that we can refer to. Well, it's not an assumption it. in the sense of like assuming that there's milk in the fridge is an assumption because that's something that can be falsified. So it, it's it is a kind of ground like there are certain boundaries to our thought that we can't really get outside of and and in that sense they are a kind of foundation because they limit our our freedom um which is another way to think about foundations but i i, I don't know Let, let's table the metaphysical discussion for a bit and we can come back to it um 
Let me just give you my version of uh, rationality or my thoughts about rationality, and then maybe we can talk a bit about morality. Sure. And then maybe we can circle back to metaphysics later. Because, I mean, it's a good topic. I'm not trying to... I just feel like we might get bogged down. Um, So I, I would say that there are three different aspects to rationality, that there isn't one... There, there is a coherent concept of it, but it contains three different aspects, at least, because we use the word in many different ways. And one of them is just consciousness or conscious thought. Mm-hmm. So rationality sometimes just means you're thinking consciously as opposed to, uh, depending on intuition or instinct or you know, any kind of subconscious process. It also refers to norms of correct thought or belief so you know reasons for believing things right uh both inductive and deductive so norms of deduction and induction and representation and then there's a third meaning that i think is important to liberalism which is a commitment to individual autonomy of belief and action or basically the idea that you are sovereign within your mind you know that you are sort of the ruler of your beliefs and your actions um you know your conscious self rules over the subconscious and also that uh well gets a little bit tricky to state this but that you can't be compelled to believe something uh, except by an appeal to your judgment, you know, that you, that, so that, that's the idea behind rational persuasion. So rather than putting a gun to somebody's head or appealing to authority or appealing to conformity, you appeal to reason. You say, well, look, here is the reason why you should believe this yourself, why you should adopt this belief yourself. Uh, so what do you think about that? Those three, like, I think those are the three um aspects of the term that come into play when we use it Hmm. well rationality as as conscious activity i can see kind of i guess etymologically how that makes sense in that as long as we're conscious we have the subject which is viewing objects and that Mm. taking into view involves a kind of ratio. There's a fundamental rational aspect to all thought um, or including representations. But I don't know that intuition is necessarily omitted from consciousness. I think we can be conscious of the application of, of intuition, although there is a sense in which like as it's brewing, it remains subconscious and it only breaks into consciousness once it applies to this kind of principle of differentiation where we can then cut it up into its analyzable components in language or in geometric representation. So I I guess, yeah, like consciousness, it does seem like a definitive aspect of fully conscious mental activity is that things are put in ratio to one another. So I, I guess I can agree with that. It seems like, although we're conscious of feelings Mm -hmm. and feelings aren't obviously uh rational i mean we we kind of call someone who's being emotional irrational so what about that wrinkle right no no i'm not saying that consciousness equals rationality but that conscious thought so it's the contrast between the subconscious and the conscious right like let's say you have a a fear of spiders and so every time you see a, a spider you get scared or maybe you you scream and you run away even though you might know that the spider is harmless, you have this feeling, and that feeling controls your actions. So it's the contrast between conscious thought controlling your actions and, in that in that example, emotion controlling your actions or this instinct controlling your actions. Um, I'm not – yeah, so maybe I didn't it, – it's difficult to talk about rationality because it's such a loaded term. Mm-hmm. Uh when but, you say thought, do you mean the activity, like the verbalizing activity, putting narratives together? Like, does it necessarily involve language for you? No, it could involve it, it. What I mean is that you are aware of the process itself. 
So it's often accompanied by that inner monologue, but it also, I mean, you're thinking when you are, you know, solving a mathematical problem or manipulating a three-dimensional object in your mind or whatever. I would call that all thought, but it's it, it, it's uh, the fact that it is done consciously and so that you have a memory of not only the results, but of the process. And the process of thought is sort of time consuming and also it involves a subject object relation to the object of thought, right? Like, um, you're set apart from it. There's a kind of, yeah, it's, it's like the mind's eye is viewing it, right? When you're, when you're considering a, like, let's say you're considering whether to believe X or not X, you have those two possibilities in mind as objects that are separate from yourself, right? So you have a subject object relation to the proposition. And so you have this sense of control over the outcome and it's not um well it's not forced on you it's it i don't know how to put this because almost every time you talk about this it turns into a homunculus inside the head right which is a fallacy but right uh Hmm. it's it's like you well it is that you have a subject object relation to the idea so you are free from your subjective perspective, you are free to agree or disagree. You have the freedom. Whereas when you're walking down the street and there's like, say, a lamp post in front of you, you walk around it without any thought. It's not like you have the choice of believing that the lamp post isn't there. You don't even have that choice. You don't have that freedom. It simply happens, right? Well, it's you simply kind of believe. counterintuitive to me at the moment because part of rationality or rational thought would be that you are compelled by these laws of logic to come to the rational con- conclusion and only by exercising some kind of freedom or creativity can you you know not go with the uh, the logical implication of the syllogism right right no you're only free until you hit upon the answer but it's it's during that process that you are free to consider the possibilities so you know, it's really that the process takes place within subjectivity and is not, uh, I don't know how to say it without making it sound like it's a homunculus. It's not imposed on you. Okay, so I, what I'm, I'm getting now is basically like feelings may happen underneath our conscious perception. They don't appear separate from us. They appear entangled in our subjective being and not their feelings don't seem to be an object to us in the same way that representations tend to be right you can't choose a feeling like you can choose a a plan or a goal and you can't uh, weigh whether or not to believe a feeling the way you can weigh what should i believe x or y you know what's the most probable explanation so Mm -hmm. it's that the representation in this case of you know p or not p appears to you subjectively as something apart from yourself that you then manipulate you know in this metaphorical sense right you can you think about it thinking is like mental manipulation of representations it's a search through a space of representations and you're conscious of the manipulation you're conscious of the process to some extent uh and that's why you have memories of it and that's how you can give reasons for why you believe something Right. Maybe they're not always accurate descriptions of how you got there, but, you know, because mm-hmm. you have this, it's like, it is in a way, like you have a homunculus. It's almost like we evolved this, you know, subject-object distinction inside the brain where we could set ourselves, the our identity apart from ideas so we could manipulate ideas almost the way we manipulate physical objects. And well, I think take there, them or leave them, you know, the way we take or leave an object. Right. I think there it is language essentially that performs this function because what it seems to be is making the principles of determination of the objects into some kind of representational structure that embodies the kind of basic causal laws that are underlying them. With feeling, you know, something just impinges on us or like comes into our 
our affect and produces a change. Whereas when we make, I mean, and you can actually make feelings objective through some kind of process of psychoanalysis and kind of describe and, and give names to these, the relation of like, I am sad because this happened. Or, you know, as, as I dwell upon this thought, my anger increases. It's converting uh, causal relations into uh, logical relations in some kind of grammar. And that's what kind of sets it before the mind is the ability to represent it um, to yourself. And I think even geometrical representational mo modalities can still be considered a language of sorts. And it's not this kind of purely animal engagement with a causal process that just determines your action. You're able some, you're, it seems that you have some degree of liberty because you, you're converting imminent events into some kind of more abstract representation of their connections. And then it's like, it's kind of like the determinism is just hiding from view because you still are compelled to change your action based on the logical entailments you see in this kind of representational language that you create. But because your mental energy is, absor is uh, absorbed in defining the logical relations and in setting them kind of geometrically before the mind, by the time you hit upon the answer to it or the implication of the the linguistic representation, you have you you've put this effort into formalizing it. The the answer hits you and you feel like you've earned that answer and this is the, the fruit of my labor and and it changes my action mm -hmm. rather than like just you know somebody hits you and you feel the pain and it's like that seems very like from the outside in yeah well the freedom is not uh contradicting determinism it's more that you experience the chaos you experience the unknown before you experience the known but uh i would say i don't think it's linguistic or i mean i, I give an example where it's purely perceptual, like an illusion where you can consciously switch from one interpretation to another, um, that at that point you can make perception conscious because there's ambiguity, so it doesn't just happen, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't just happen automatically and you're, it impinges on you, on your subjectivity. Your subjectivity is involved in the process. So it's more about what, at what level does the processing take place? If it takes place uh well at the conscious level then it's conscious and it's thought and you have this uh you know feeling of freedom about it right like you might see somebody you're like oh is that my grandmother walking down the street oh no maybe that's somebody else but kind of looks like my grandmother so you know you think about it you might look for cues now you're consciously making the decision is it your grandmother or not right what it so, seems to be related to then is ambiguity Right, right. Sorry. Well, it's 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 that the it's that the well, what I would say is that it gets up to this higher level cognitive process that the decision is not made at a lower level. There is some higher level process that gets the decisions that can't be made at a lower level raised up to it, and that's what consciousness is. Um, yeah, and I I would look at that essentially as a linguistic process because it involves abstracting from the concrete sense data, right? The further, when you say a higher level process, what you really, I think, mean is a more abstract process. And yes, but I wouldn't, I don't think it's done in words. I guess that's my point. I think it's done with concepts and uh, yeah. search. So. But there's still represent like the higher level abstractions in the mind, even if they're not signified by words, they, they represent... Uh, mm -hmm they engage in representation in the same sense that language does. So well, I guess that's a different conception of language a, a bit, but. Well, the thing is, I would say that when you perceive a lamppost or a tree, when you're walking down the street, you're all, that's a representation too, but it is generated automatically, you know, instinctively quickly. So you're not aware of the process. It doesn't get to this higher level because there's no ambiguity in the signal. Your brain maps it to a representation and, this conscious level is the manipulation of representations. It's the searching through, and it, yeah, the ambiguity is critical to it. That there is, there is um, information that has to be flipped one way or another, right? There's right. a bit in an indeterminate state. Like, is it my grandmother or not? 
should I make this choice or not? And that, that allows f degrees of freedom for the manipulation of kind of mental symbols. They may be words, or they may mm -hmm. be like the idea that you have of your grandmother's face versus the kind of way that you're piecing together the sense data. But yeah, this kind of ambiguity creates degrees of freedom in the possible arrangements of these uh, symbolic reference within the mind. So I, it seems like we're basically getting at the same thing there. So that's one of your aspects right. of rationality. <laughs> and I think that I can pretty much, it seems like I agree with that. The last one, uh, is that like normative or is this a claim that, that well, uh, yeah, what exactly is that? Okay. So the, the second one uh, you're passing over, I guess, because you agree, right? That there, we often use the term to say, refer to things like logic or probability theory, any, any, um, a norm of how to arrive at correct beliefs, we call that rationality, right? So we have some model of right. how thought is is um, supposed to work or what its function is, and we can we can evaluate thought or thought processes as good or bad relative to that norm. Yeah, the third one is it is a little bit hard. I don't know if it's gonna be harder than the first one, but. Um, you know, when we talk about rational debate, what we're talking about is not just adherence to the norms of reason. It's a respect for the autonomy of belief of the other person. You know, that like this comes out of freedom of conscience. Like a, there are a lot of related ideas that are in liberalism that are related to rationality, like, uh, you know, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and so on. Uh, if you are engaging in rational debate, you are committed, I was committed is the right word, you're respecting the other person's judgment, ability to make judgments. You're saying, well, this other person, I think they have the ability to, uh, to think. Right. So I'm not going to. And, and maybe I don't have the ability to force them to believe what I'm going to believe. But, you know, you're not presuming to um, manipulate them subconsciously with trickery, with, you know, rhetorical devices or emotion appeals to emotion. You're not just uh, bullying them or, you know, pressuring them or whatever. You're saying, yeah, OK, I think this them. person. Sorry, what? hypnotizing them or something like that sure yeah you're you're appealing to their conscious their ability to consciously think and you know reason and so you're presenting them with reasons why they should believe something and then you're allowing them to verify or disagree right, right. you're giving them that freedom you're not you know you're not uh trying to impose it on them without their conscious awareness of the possibilities and without their conscious thought processes engaging with the question. So you're giving it to them as that indeterminate bit with reasons mm -hmm. that you feel are sufficient to flip the bit in the direction that you have flipped it. Right. But, but you're not presenting it, it to them as an unflippable bit, right? Which is when you're appealing to authority, you're not giving them the choice. You're not giving it to them as an indeterminate thing. Um, or you're not giving them something that you assume they have the tools to determine by their own uh, act of representation. You're kind of just saying, you know, there you have to accept that there is a logical connection. There's some kind of rational principle of connection underlying these ideas that you simply don't have access to. Like an idea that, you know, Jesus was real. Jesus was the son of God. You just have to accept that stuff as a self-contained proposition um, and, you know, when you go to ask, why do I know this or why is this true? That's just closed to you. So in that sense, it's, you're not it's not left to them to determine these things. They just have to accept it whole hog. Right. You're denying them. In, in a sense, you're denying them mental freedom. You're also kind of denying the mental responsibility. Right. For for the bit that that's in question. No. Yeah, I know that's it, very abstract, but now this is a norm, right? This is like. A, a prescriptive kind of statement or do you think you're making a claim about the nature of the world when you put this third principle forward well i i would state it as a commitment or maybe an attitude 
toward relating to others, that you you try to relate to them as if they are capable of making judgments. And so it kind of goes along with this idea of a free society or, you know, the individuals assenting to the social order rather than having it imposed on them through, say, trickery, right? So let's say we think people are too stupid to understand the way society works, which the NRX people would say, and, and actually I would say too. So we have to trick them into accepting the social order without giving them any reasons for it. We have to get them when they're young, you know, mold them so that they take it for granted, so they believe it, never let them hear the other side of the argument, you know, never let them have that bit in an indeterminate state in their mind. Never let that bit get into consciousness where they can consider the options, right? We want to flip that bit for them and never give them the freedom to, uh, you know, to right. have it in that indeterminate state. So I'm not saying, I don't think there is such a thing as complete rationality, like in the way that I'm defining it, conscious thought is almost well, it's really almost always bounded, except maybe in the moment of the cogito, the moment of staring into the abyss. Other than that, it's always bounded by presuppositions, assumptions, etc. It takes for granted the judgments made by subconscious processes, by perception, all those things. Um, so rationality is bounded. It takes place within a space. Uh, but, you know, a greater commitment to rationality is a commitment to expand the space. And a lesser commitment would be to shrink it. So an authoritarian society gives individuals very little freedom, not only of action, but of belief, right? It says, okay, here's what you have to believe. You have to have – your boundaries of thought are very limited. Right. And they exclude things like the, the social order itself. Liberalism is this idea that, well, we can expand this box and bring things into it that were formerly outside of it, like – religion like what religion do you believe we'll let you decide um you know your moral judgments we'll let you have your own moral judgments we won't try to trick you into them maybe we'll give you reasons for this one versus that one and the social order like the concept of a social contract is based on the idea of the population agreeing to the social order which means they must have considered it evaluated it right in a democracy, you have choices, so you have bits that you can flip when you vote, and then, you know, those bits are aggregated to, you know, flip a, a collective bit that determines the outcome, right? So the idea of liberalism is, is not only giving people more personal freedom to live their lives the way they choose, but also giving them um, these mental freedoms, right? Saying, oh, yeah, the, the way we order society is actually something that we can – disagree on, debate, discuss, think about, and maybe change. Whereas right. any authoritarian system will say, no, no, the way society, the, the order of society is is fixed. It's not something you're allowed to think about. It's not something we're ever going to change. Uh, it's not something you get to agree or disagree with. You have to agree to it or you have to agree with it. You have to just you know, accept it. You're not even supposed to think about it. You just have to profess agreement, right? You just have to chant the slogans, and that's it, right? Right. Um, so I think that that's where liberalism is. I mean, liberalism is tied to rationality through the concept of freedom, and uh, and and subjective freedom. <clears throat> excuse me. Subjective freedom is is that mental freedom to consider alternatives. Right. And now, choose one. The critique of liberalism would tend to be that there's a pretty big lie in that kind of political presupposition uh, for most people. Like most people don't have the liberty to consider they will end up being manipulated by others. And so what you can do is, you know, rally through democratic processes, uninformed masses to support uh, political propositions that are really to your own benefit. And so like they, they never really had the freedom. You're just telling them, oh, you're free to, to vote. You're free to choose your political future when really they are determined by the media they consume by, and you know, these right. 
centers of power control the media, they control the education, that the authoritarianism will inevitably apply to almost everyone in the society. And so the, I guess the kind of balanced position I would see is acknowledging that almost everyone, you know, the vast majority of people don't have freedom to consider what kind of society they'd like to live in. They don't get to engage in the the negotiation of the social contract. And so rather than telling them, oh, you have this freedom, which will end up just being appropriated and manipulated by some center of power, you instead say that the liberalism applies to this particular cognitive type. There are, there are certain people that can negotiate interests and form these social contracts, and they can cooperate through rationality in such a way that allows them to have their own little authoritarianisms and then come together to the big table where we no negotiate, you know, what shared externalities do we actually have? What do we have to collectivize on? What, what do we have to cooperate on? And then each of them goes back and engages in their own authoritarian type society. So this is kind of the balanced position rather than one global dictatorship and I, I don't mean the earth, but like a nationwide dictatorship or a nationwide lib nationwide liberalism, you can have a kind of elitist liberalism where the, the top echelon, the, cog the people who are capable of rationality uh, engage in that kind of negotiation of interests and, and put reason as something that's beyond sovereignty, beyond any individual's power. And then beneath that, we accept and don't lie about the fact that like, yeah, people are basically determined by their circumstances, by their education. And so the, for the people who are determined, we basically treat them in a way like you would treat a farm animal where the cow doesn't get to negotiate its interests, but you should be humane to the farm animal and like give them, a, I don't know, reasonable accommodations. Yeah. Well, I mean, now you've certainly hit on the problem, right? Which we agree on, which is that people are not, I mean, it's usually phrased as people are not very rational, which means that they can't handle too much freedom. They don't have the mental equipment to deal with too much freedom. They need a lot of bits flipped for them in advance so they can think. Otherwise, they get confused or they make the wrong decisions or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And the same thing applies to something like the social contract and to democracy. The critiques of democracy are absolutely correct. I mean, there are other critiques of democracy uh, besides that people don't make good or aren't capable of making good choices. You know, they're not incentivized to make them. But even if they were incentivized to make them, they probably couldn't make them because they don't understand how society works. They don't. You know, like most people would prefer communism to capitalism because it sounds nicer, you know. Uh, so you're going to get – so this is the problem, <laughs> that people are not very that, – that rationality is bounded, right? It's not this it, – it, you, you're not going to take – I mean, even the smartest people are going to – probably not going to start with the cogito and – build up a worldview from that point. Uh, even if they did, they might not converge on the same worldviews. And the masses of people it might have the illusion of freedom, the illusion of democracy, the illusion of assenting to the social contract, but in reality, they're, they're just sheeple. You know, they're just being herded one way or another by media or by whatever, by historical forces, by their own... Um, social dynamics like they're you know uh generating social delusions through feedback loops and all this stuff right so so this is the problem now, i'm not saying that i expect you to have an answer or that i have an answer for it but um it seems like you're saying the solution is you have a bunch of dictatorships with rational leaders but that doesn't seem like an answer because i don't i don't see how that would happen well, what you do is have a community of potential leaders that filter each other based on their rationality. And, and, and this is kind of what happens at a global scale now. Like the international community says, uh, you know, Basar al-Ashad or Kim Jong-un, you're not a rational leader. 
So uh, you're going to be excommunicated from the League of Nations or from whatever. And and you suppress those dictatorships that are run by people who are not capable of rationally assessing global existentialities. Uh, so well, that's one way. I mean, I don't think that's why they're suppressing people like Bashar al-Assad, though. There are other considerations, but I think that's basically the principle behind the current globalist agenda. You want only like those who basically abide by this kind of liberal ideology or neoliberal ideology being able to to influence the destiny of nations. It's like mm. the, the agenda of liberalizing, of spreading democracy. That's kind of the whole point. I don't know. I think you're much more optimistic than about the global order than I am, which is I'm kind of surprised by. But I, I mean, I don't think that's what's going on. I think, uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad is, is pretty rational. And I mean I, I mean, I don't really know too much about Syria or what Syrian politics are like, but I think it's more of a power struggle between people who probably don't really have much understanding of the world themselves, but just know how to play the game, you know, mm. like, yeah, I, I don't see any, I don't see collective rationality on a global scale. I think if we had collective rationality, we wouldn't have a population explosion in Africa We'd be doing something about that. We wouldn't be flooding the West with immigrants. We wouldn't be just burning up the, you know, fossil fuels mm. to, you know, generate plastic I, junk. I mean, I think the structure of the the Western elite, like the fact that they have these conferences, they have Bilderberg, they have the Aspen Institute, they have the Council on Foreign Relations, they have a set of technocratic institutions, basically that that, that determine policy for the West. And th this power struggle is essentially, I think, between nationalist forces, romanticist, irrationalist forces um, on the part of Russia. And obviously, Iran and Syria are just uh, within this kind of nationalist, uh, Duganist kind of ideology. Of th they're seeking a multipolar order, ultimately, because they're seeking their own power. And yeah, that applies to the people, the individuals in the Western order too, the elites who want to secure their power and privilege in society. But the the tools of governance they use in the West, it, they're multinational, uh, academic, technocratic organizations. They're big on research. They're big on these sorts of like guiding principles. And to an extent, they they instrumentalize these these conferences and these research institutions for goals that are really just they're they're being achieved because elite people want them to be achieved but i think even the elites themselves have a certain commitment to a kind of rational order for humanity as a whole and i think they're concerned about existential threats whereas when you look at like i believe i'm trusting a commenter from my youtube channel but putin once said like what do i care about humanity if there's no russia and this is the kind of you know, nationalist, irrationalist thinking that can lead to uh, very harmful externalities for the globe. So uh, it's not that I think the Western elites are explicitly trying to, like, convert all nations into purely the elites of all nations into purely rational actors. But that is kind of the the directing energy behind their push. And that's the, the explicit justification behind their push. Right. These mm. these dictatorships well. are insufficiently rational and liberal. I guess my view, it, it's an interesting, I don't know, your view is interesting, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's entirely wrong, but uh, it, it's true that there's probably a greater, at least, I don't know what the right word, I don't want to say lip service, because it's more than lip service, there is a greater commitment to rationality in the West, just generally, going back historically, and among Western elites, than in the rest of the world. But at the same time, I guess I see the elites as just another layer of sheeple kind of uh, blundering around without really understanding what's going on. You know, I, I don't and I don't think and also there is also conflicting interests like just as Putin says, who cares what happens to the world if Russia isn't in it? Um, I'm sure these elites feel the same way about their, you know, their own wealth and stuff like that, that their interests are are much bigger to them, much more important to them than, you know, things far away or in the distant future. So I, 
I think that what's going on is, uh, you know, a tragedy of the commons. And the elites are not really, they, they are taking some big issues into account. They have not gotten us into a nuclear war, which is good, you know, but yeah. then they haven't I, solved many problems, right? Like they're just sort of. I think they are, though, with like from one perspective, bringing in all the immigrants, lowering the quality of life um, seems to be creating chaos. But really, it is creating a greater level of order. And this is what you know, in Juvenilian power analysis is termed the high, low versus middle. And because the middle classes in the West are the threat to the power structure, like they might come up with some breakthrough ideology. Like it was the middle class ideology of communism that threatened the uh, the Westphalian order in Europe uh, around the turn of the last century. And so they want to suppress that potentiality from the middle by basically dumbing them down with lower IQ populations, which so, would would seem pretty <laughs> like, yeah, you're going to create a deterministic lower class. So de-rationalizing the population to be to allow for greater scope of rationality above. Yes. It. Yes. So that, the that in class, itself, hmm. it, it, it might be the rational thing to do. Right. If the middle class puts forward romantic ideologies, but because they're smart, because they have intel intelligence is different from rationality. Right. Intelligence is yeah. the ability to solve problems. And so if you have a high IQ, you know, virile middle class with some kind of warrior ethos or nationalist romanticist ethos, and they can threaten this this kind of more rationalist, elitist global order that these people are concerned with, like, yeah, how do we uh, achieve um, sus uh, sustainability in terms of the climate, how do we reduce the human population overall, they, to have the freedom, the latitude for that elite class to treat the globe in a rational way and just deal with... So basically, it's like we're going to dumb down these middle-class Westerners because they're our greatest threat. We're going to dumb them down, make them impotent through all this immigration and chaos so that we real rational adults can actually get things done. So we can do the things that need to be done instead of fighting with our own middle class all the time. It's an interesting theory. I don't know. I, I'm not fully persuaded. Let's put it that way. Uh, but it's an interesting idea. I, I, I don't see that much rationality among the elites. Now, maybe it's because they're just lying, you know, because they're not being rational in their approach to dealing with the population. So in your view, they're totally manipulating everybody else. They have no commitment to rationality below a certain level, but among themselves, they have a commitment to rationality. But but to the masses, they have no commitment. I mean, it, I, I don't know how that would work, right? Because... Well, I, it's I mean, kind well, of the way you treat... So somebody's part of the chosen group... You know the special group, yeah. and they are afforded therefore certain rights, and we're going to have normative, uh, you know, structure of discourse, and yeah, you have certain rights if you're in the club, but if you're outside of the club, then you're cattle, you're subhuman. I think there there's definitely that kind of it's Ubermensch mentality um, in that faction. Yeah, I don't know. Well. I mean, we can set this aside for now. I'll I'll think about it more. I I don't think it explains what's going on, but you know, it's an interesting idea. Um, but let, let's go back to morality, actually, because we we're going to talk about that, and we haven't really talked about that. So, mm -hmm. your idea of morality, if I understand it correctly, based on previous discussions, was that it uh, comes out of selfishness. Well, actually, just explain it to me again, because I think you derive it from a kind of he hedonistic value assumption right. and selfishness, but then there is uh, more to it than that that comes into it that somehow... Mm -hmm. like. Well, I think following this kind of principle of rationality uh, that every proposition has to have a ground you have to be able to refer to you know what exactly does this concept or term signify what are you pointing to when we use terms like good or bad the only rational ground 
or I mean, technically it's an irrational ground, but the only rational way to account for the, the usage of the term good and bad is that it originates from pleasure and pain or positive subjective value and negative subjective value, right? I think just genealogically, where do we get the concepts good and bad? It originates out of, for each of us, our own immediate reference of the the feeling that we get of pleasure or pain. And then we can abstract into these rationalisms and sometimes detach entirely from their its basis in pleasure and pain. But then what you end up having is a concept that signifies ultimately nothing because it's not connected to that empirical ground from actual experience. Um, and so that's what leads to a lot of confusion about morality. But this doesn't mean that uh, the good at a higher level of, of abstraction can't point to what will end up being better for you in the long run in ways that are counterintuitive to this kind of immediate term hedonistic uh, incentives built into the, the pleasure center of the brain. So like it might seem that if the good is simply pleasure, then I just ought to do heroin, right? Because then I'll feel very, very good. But then you engage in a higher level of abstraction and think about yourself outside of time and look at the entire consequence of your action. You say, well, no, actually, I'm going to be much worse off if I do the heroin now because there will be much more pain in my future than there otherwise would be. Well, using broader kind of metaphysical arguments that I, I've I've given well, at various sure. times in the past, I can ex extrapolate beyond a human lifetime. And given that I believe in reincarnation and, and certain other dynamics, I end up concluding that the moral thing to do is actually to refrain from desire. We think that we gain greater pleasure by giving into desire, but ultimately, no, the more you can abstain and sublimate desire, the the greater ultimately your reward will be in terms of positive subjective value. Well, OK, uh, I don't know how you could know that, but about reincarnation uh, and stuff. Well, yeah, but also even something like even setting that aside, like with the heroin example, how would you know that by not doing heroin, you're going to have more pleasure? Well, you can argue empirically and say that, you know, my using certain assumptions, well, obviously, that can be well grounded, like your psychological makeup is roughly analogous to mine. I see when you do heroin that your life goes to crap and like your life expect expectancy goes down, self-reported survey data, what I, people who report sure. using heroin report lower quality of life later on. Like you can point to those things inductively. And I think that's pretty convincing. Well, I don't know. I, so I'll make a couple of, I mean, our value theories are going to be different. So that's going to throw a wrench in this. But I mean, I, I don't believe you can be happier, more or less happy, period. So I don't think it makes any difference. Um, but like whether you do heroin or, or anything else, but. Um, See, it just doesn't make sense, though. Like, well, do you really, because if you. And I don't mean just like sweeping, put put down that theory. It's counterintuitive. And imagine it is but, counterintuitive. But let but me give, you, give a counterexample and just see how you respond to it real quick up front. So, and this is a gruesome example. I don't want to even have to give it. But imagine someone is born or I guess even in the fetus, like – you mess with the fetus. You basically cause the, the fetus a lot of pain. It's born deformed. You basically torture the baby as soon as it's born, and then you you kill it while it's still in pain. You don't think in the the like negative value of that life is clearly more powerful than a person who is healthy and in a loving family and who got everything they wanted in life and died in their sleep at an old age like that these are equivalent in terms of the value well I, I don't okay so i don't equate value with pleasure and pain i think they're equivalent in terms of the net ups and downs of emotional experience because of the way the mechanism works uh, and, and you're building into that thought experiment a whole bunch of assumptions like you can just torture something you know keep torturing it and it's in pain uh if all it's ever known is torture then torture is the natural condition for it and so that's not really pain you, you know you can't really just indefinitely torture people um you can put them in a i mean it, it's it gets complicated and this is not something that 
uh, I think I can fully explain in this discussion. It's something I want to yeah, I mean, it's something I need to go into more detail in, in a separate thing, but and I've written up stuff on this, but I haven't put anything in, in uh, audio in detail. But, well, I mean, the simple answer is yes. I, I don't think it matters. Like, I, you know, you can look at people who are crippled and they live their whole lives in wheelchairs and they never get to, you know, do any of the things that you enjoy and, and all that. And if you look at them, their emotional states are exactly like yours. They go up and down. They feel good or bad based on what's going on in their lives, just as you do. But, you know, your life may have way more opportunities to to do things that you value. And they might wish that they were you and you would feel terrible if you were put in their position. But if you look at the two people and you see, OK, when are they happy? When are they sad? You make a little chart it's going to add up to exactly the same. And they're both going to be happy roughly half the time and sad or, you know, unhappy the other half of the time. Um, you know, like they, they do talk about the hedonic treadmill, right? That you, you know, you get something you want and it makes you feel good for a little while, but then you get bored of it and now you want something else. And now if you get, you know, another thing like that, it's not going to make you feel good. So that's one thing, which is I don't think there is any winning at this game. Uh, but that's a pretty involved discussion to get into. That's fine. Let me, again, like raise but a I, contention or, or at least a question about this view. So if if we were all blank slates and we didn't have instincts that are already built into us to just inherently prefer certain kinds of outcomes, then you know maybe that would more or less pan out what you're saying that like if we're acclimated to the suffering it's going to basically register as neutral to us if that's all we've ever had but like evolution has selected for this kind of motivational mechanism that has certain end states already built in as favorable and that favorability well, of them is measured subjectively in terms of their pleasurability and so no 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 no, no. that's not how it works um if you're hungry Okay, let's say you go without food for five days, and I give you a McDonald's hamburger. How is that going to make you feel? Great. Amazingly great. Yeah. Amazing. But right. during the entire time you're eating it and afterward, you're going to be hungrier, much hungrier than you are right now. Much hungrier. So the actual outcome, the actual state of your body, of your you know hunger system or whatever, your motivational system, is going to be desperately need food. During that entire time, you're feeling that incredible pleasure. So you don't get the pleasure from the state. You get it from the change of the state. And that's and, and it's necessary for that for it to be that way or it wouldn't work, right? And the thing about what we didn't evolve to feel right. good or to like run a race, get to the end, and then lounge around for the rest of our lives feeling good, right? We evolved to reproduce, and so that's an open-ended goal. And you can always work more toward that goal so the brain has a little Sisyphus mechanism in it that makes you, you know, the ball, the, the rock always goes back down the hill and you always have to push it up again to feel good. Um, that's, that's the, you know, the hamster wheel mechanism or whatever that makes you keep going through life. You're yeah. driven through life by these ups and downs. And it doesn't matter how good your life is, you're going to be driven. It doesn't matter agree, how bad you're I agree with that. I agree with that. But how will it have worked if it's true that the total pleasure or pain experienced by the subject is identical no matter what the subject does? How is it possible that given fixed instincts to, and archetypes to prefer certain kinds of life outcomes would have evolved if that motivation mechanism is totally egalitarian and doesn't care about what you do? How could well, it work the as a motivation no, no, no. mechanism? The motivation drives you to act. So motivation is not pain or pleasure. Motivation is motivation. And a change in motivation gives you pain or pleasure. Like if you take an opiate drug, your motivations disappear and thus you feel good. So the goodness is linked to the reduction of the motivations. And I, I would identify motivation with attraction and revulsion. 
if well, I'm attracted to something, I'm motivated to seek it out. If I'm revolted, uh, repulsed by something, I'm motivated to distance myself from it. Right, but the unpleasant feelings are not the same as motivation. So, like when you're walking down the street, you're motivated to walk. But you're not feeling pain, right? But if you suddenly, if somebody blocks your way, you feel a sudden irritation. You feel a sudden bit of pain because the motivation is there, but it's not being uh, put into action. It's blocked. You have a, now an increased motivation, which is how do I get around this thing? So, again, this is a pretty involved discussion of how the thing works. But the reason why it's counterintuitive, of course, is that our values are not simply uh, the ability to predict the effects of an action on pain and pleasure. They are they are generated to make us do what is good for us evolutionarily. So they are based on emotion, but they are not just the like ab an abstraction of what causes pleasure or pain. So I'll give another example. Like if you go out in the cold, it makes you feel bad, right? So go out in the cold for a day and like go out working in the fields and a you know and you live in a place that has snow. So <laughs> go out, go for a, an hour long walk without a jacket. Okay. Uh, come home, you'll be hypothermic it'll feel bad right but when you and then go and have a nice warm bath and the nice warm bath will feel really good yeah so you'll have a bad feeling and a good feeling that balances out the bad feeling your brain however will say walking in cold is bad it will negatively value that like next time you'll remember your jacket or whatever right and oh when you're cold warming getting in the bath is good so it will make those value judgments but the cause of the good feeling of being in the in the bath is not just the bath. It's also the walk beforehand. It's also being cold, right? So that's an, a necessary precondition for the good feeling. If you hadn't gone out for a walk in the cold and gotten hypothermic, you wouldn't be able to feel good by warming up. So, but your brain does not, for very good reasons, does not say, oh, hey, I should go, if I walk in the cold, it will make me feel good. Even though that is true, right? That's the truth. But because it gives you the potential to feel good by warming up, it's a necessary cause of that. But your but your model of what is good and bad is not just what causes the feeling. It is what what actions. Pre I don't know how to explain it. It's basically what is good for you. So values are not the same as pleasure and pain. When you value something, that is an abstraction that you have learned from experience uh, of of the pleasure or pain of something. Well, it's learned from emotional experience, but it does not represent the net effect on emotional experience. And that's the key point. Because it's not there to do that, it's there to model what is good for you. Anyway, this is... I don't want to go off on a huge tangent about this. We could even... For now, we could just agree to disagree, because I don't want to derail this and i wanted to get your understand your idea about morality so i'm willing to like you know take your assumptions you know uh -huh. for sake of argument well, yeah just to respond to that one last time though and i brought this same point up and i just i didn't i don't know what kind of answer i ultimately got to it but so you go out on that walk in the cold you come back and you really want to take a bath right that's mm -hmm. what you that's what you feel would make you happy but your theory would say that whether you take that bath or not you're going to be ultimately just as happy and that seems mm -hmm. counterintuitive and if if like you know say in the in timeline one i go and take a bath and i feel i get all of the good pleasure that uh i kind of built up by being out in the painful cold that <laughs> And then Whoa. someone comes and assassinates me immediately after. And then in the other timeline, I come in from the cold, I'm miserable. And then instead of taking a warm bath, I, you know, I don't know, sure. like strip, strip down naked and like get, you know, open the freezer door. And then someone comes and assassinates me and my life ends. Right, it right, right. It seems okay. like there is obviously a discrepancy in the total value experienced well, by the individual in timeline A and timeline B. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, this is like... I've answered this with so many people and also to myself many, many times. Um, one way, first of all, there's no real way to do this kind of accounting anyway, because we don't store experiences in our heads, right? So it's all sort of hypothetical. Uh, 
when you've experienced pleasure or pain, it's gone. You have a memory that you did feel it, but you can never re-feel it, right? Now, you could count the moment of death as pleasure if you're you know, as sort of can't balancing the account at the end. So if let's say you're, you're freezing cold and you, you, now your life has ended, well, the, the, the motivation went to zero when you died, right? So you could say, well, motivation going to zero counts as pleasure in this accounting scheme. Or you can just say, okay, at the end of your life, you might have a little leftover residue, but basically over your entire life, it's going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And so basically it adds up to nothing, but you know, there might be this little residue at the end. To me, it doesn't really matter because you're always, you know, effectively running this little deficit anyway. But, you know, other than timing your death <laughs> perfectly, what difference does it make? Okay, so I guess yeah. to me, it doesn't really matter. Like if you now, want to do the accounting, you can do it and you could say that when you die, it cancels out the, you know, because your motivation to warm up is gone now, just like the motivation to warm up is gone once you've warmed up. So your potential to, you know, your your built up potential for pleasure is getting canceled by death. So you could say, well, death is a little more pleasurable when you're, you know, when you want a lot, when you're strongly motivated to change your condition. Because it does change your condition. Or you could say, well, yeah, I lost that, you know, at the end of my life, that residue remained. But it, where did it remain? It didn't remain anywhere anyway, because it, none of it remains. There is no piling up of this stuff, right? The right, pleasure and pains it. you experienced before don't exist now in any in any sense. So, it, it you know, there's right. a bigger critique of it, which is it's just this transient stuff that it, it doesn't, it only exists in the moment. And the only real effect of it is it motivates you to do things, and uh, so why do, why does it even matter that you're that you're feeling it when at the end of the day you have accumulated nothing, right? Uh huh. Yeah, I got that. So if if though you're a temporal B theorist and you don't think the past stops existing once you're done experiencing it, then you could in principle tally up the course of a life all the pleasure and pain in it. And I don't know that you've really demonstrated that it necessarily sums to zero, but I can well, assume that for the sake of argument for now. What, what I'm arguing is that it doesn't matter. I mean, what I'm arguing is you can go either way. I don't really care. I mean, it depends on precise definitions, right? If you simply define pain and pleasure as the ups and downs of motivation, the moment you die, every motivation disappears. So any motivation you had, like the motivation to warm up, disappears at the moment of death, and therefore it would sum to zero necessarily. Because it starts at zero, it ends at zero, and the in-betweens are all just ups and downs. Right. So, But I, in, I guess I, that, don't, I don't necessarily accept that it automatically starts at zero. Like, that's sure. what, has that been demonstrated? As opposed to, like, isn't it possible that an organism living in an environment suitable to its evolutionary conditioning has all sorts of instincts met and all of that keeps it at a general level of satisfaction? Another organism in a totally unsuitable environment never has those instincts met. And the way the, the psychology works is that it's overall in a dissatisfied state. And so like the course of its life is in the negative, so to speak. The other life is in the positive. Like I don't see why that's well, not dissatisfaction positive. is satisfaction versus dissatisfaction is not what causes pain and pleasure experientially right being warm like right now you're just as warm as you would be at the end of the bath right but you experience no pleasure from just well, that's, being and that's what i'm disagreeing with that that's necessarily true even if there's no radical change of state just the state of being like and also for us abstractly we can say like i'm in a position that's amenable to my reproduction i'm doing what i should be doing as an organism i didn't just experience pain and so i don't like viscerally feel a great relief from that pain going away but overall i know that i'm in a good position i'm, I'm pretty much content and i think animals have a kind of sense in that this is backed up by like instincts of dominance hierarchy where you kind of know like i'm not i'm at a bad place in the pecking order and my brain is telling me like you're kind of you, you know that, you're not in a good doesn't place doesn't correspond to feelings of pain and pleasure though that's the thing that's Are the whole point of yeah because that's the whole point of good Going out in the – if you wanted to experience pleasure right now, you'd have to do something to remove, move yourself away from homeostasis or 
you know, basically satisfy motivation that had to come into existence first. And then that's the point of the fact that the person in the wheelchair and the person who has, you know, a successful productive life, their emotional states appear to be basically the same. If you look at people in the third world versus people in the first world, you know, you don't see a difference if you just walk around. But I think that your your kind of self-concept of where you stack up in the dominance hierarchy, that does have a big impact on your overall life satisfaction to a point, right? It, like going up higher than a certain income bracket or whatever doesn't seem to make a big difference. But if you are in poverty, it like self-report of life quality is lower than if you're not. And that's sure, over the course of a whole life. No, nobody can really, I mean, like, again, you don't have any accumulated, you, you don't have a, anything in your brain that accumulates pain and pleasure, right? So you have no idea, like you can only, you can only have a psychological theory to arrive at these conclusions. An ordinary person, when they say, am I satisfied with my life? Of course, they're going to compare themselves to others because they have no way to, uh, they have no way to do it. Like they have to compare themselves to something, right? So how are they going to, like, what, like, that's the thing. How do you know if you've had a satisfied life? What's the alternative? So you're never going to be able to compare your subjectivity to somebody else's subjectivity and say, oh, I had a better subjectivity. You're only going to be able to look at objective things, right? Like, do I have a bigger house? You know, did I get more girls or whatever? Well, you yeah, you project the desire that others have for the things that they obtain. And to a certain extent, what you want to achieve in life is shaped by what you observe others getting. But you can be conscious of the fact that I have achieved those things that I wanted in life. Like I wanted to be a policeman. I became a policeman. I got married. I yeah, everything that I sure. wanted to do with my life, I got. And so you could say, well, I'm I'm in a good position. Whereas someone who wanted all these things and didn't get them could say, I never got what I wanted in life. Right. I'm not but you're evaluating your objective conditions. You're not evaluating your subjectivity. And there's absolutely no way for you to evaluate your subjectivity because you have nothing to compare it to. Well, I think no, because it, you know it's not like you never experienced any satisfaction, and everyone has some. Well, almost everyone has some moment of pleasure in their life or oh, when, when they do feel good about themselves. And you can kind of, through a kind of theory, I think we all build a theory or maybe are programmed with one already about how this motivational structure works. And you can say, if I had won that game, I would feel happier than I do now. And you, yeah, can, you, you can, can be say right that. about that. You right. No, right I think about. you're, no, I think that's the big mistake that you might have that delusion or whatever you might believe that because you haven't really thought about it but what you're really saying is i value these things and i've have them and you're almost always if you're if somebody asks you how satisfied are you about your life it's inevitable that you're going to compare yourself to other people because there's really no way to answer that question without like you you can't like when somebody says how they're asking for a relative they're, they're asking about a scale yeah Right? You can and you compare have those, it to you can compare it to like counterfactual scenarios you, where you ended sure. up differently. If you right, right. So you can imagine, and people always imagine, well, if I, my life would have been much worse if I had been in a wheelchair or born in a third world country or whatever. But when you're making that comparison, what you're doing is comparing your objective conditions to somebody else's objective conditions or to hypothetical objective conditions, and right. you're saying, well, if I were placed in that situation, I would feel bad. But that's not the same as saying, well, my overall amount of pain and pleasure would, you know, would be higher or lower if I were in that condition. So you, you just like – anyway, it's, it's like a fallacy that people are making um, if they think they can make judgments about their subjectivity in that way. Uh, it's also a kind of fallacy of composition, the assumption that, well – in this moment, I could be happier if I, you know, had a nicer chair or something, right? So in any given moment, you could be more or less happy based on what you do, but that does not mean that over the course of your life, you could be more or less happy based on what you do. Because those feelings are interdependent. So they don't just add up, right? Like, you can't, you can be... You can but feel here, good by having a warm bath, the thing, not, but you have to be cold first. 
because right, the, so that's the point that right. you can't the, just make yourself feel better now by having a warm bath because you're not hypothermic, right? Uh huh. But we also build up mental habits, and if you are in the habit of experiencing reward mechanisms, then you can train that into your psychology to be the standard response to a situation. Whereas if you habitually you encounter some scenario and you tear yourself down, you insult yourself mentally. Uh, then you build those neural pathways. And so like in, in a way, we do tally up these rewards and punishments that we give to ourselves because we kind of index them in that the future, the way that I respond to future scenarios will be impacted by the way that I've responded to past scenarios. And if I tend towards a de uh, depressive mentality, I'm more likely to respond in a depressive way to the same stimulus compared to if I had had more of an optimistic mentality. Well, you might be more likely to respond in a certain way behaviorally, but I'm not sure what that implies about what you're feeling. Uh, I mean, we can measure it in terms of the, the chemistry of the brain. It's clear that some people have greater dopamine production and some people have less, right? Well, sure. I mean, you can do a lot of objective experiments. I mean, I don't know that you're going to reduce subjectivity to simply like you, you can't measure subjective experience you can measure what goes on in a brain but you can't measure subjective experience right but hypothetically so, we can say and, and you can there's ways that you can test this in that you can evaluate your experience while you are hooked up to some kind of monitor that measures the level of you know chemical dopamine you have in the brain and you can look at the correlations between your your subjective experience and these objective metrics now hypothetically we can or as a hypo hypothesis that is we can say that the amount uh, a brain that has dopamine running through it represents a positive subjective state of mind and that means that if somebody is just chronically low in their dopamine production, they don't get to have dopamine flowing through their brain very often, meaning they're not in a happy state of mind very often compared to someone who, in a, if that hypothesis turns to be right, and this correlation between the subjective experience of pain, or, or rather the subjective experience of pleasure and the presence of chemical dopamine, well, if that holds, then... Uh, it's going to depend on a bunch of assumptions, but you might be able to do some experiments. I think you're going to... You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think you're going to falsify what I'm saying, though. But, uh, you know, the the opiate drug experiment is a great example that that kind of shows what I'm saying. I mean, it, it's a great, um, it's good evidence for it that you can chemically act directly on your brain to feel great, but you're going to have withdrawal and feel shitty. So it doesn't, it doesn't have any effect. Like you can chemically act directly into your brain to feel good. But, you know, you're going to feel bad later. It, and the uh, reason for that is that these chemicals release the dopamine that you've produced over some period of time. Right. And then, um, no, and no, then your, I don't the withdrawal is that you're you don't have. No, no, no. Saturation. Endorphins do something quite a bit. I, I'm not sure exactly what opiate drugs do, but I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think it has something to do with dopamine or whatever. It's. um. Yeah. Whichever chemical, like you, the fact that you flood it with one at one moment in time means that now you kind of have emptied the reservoirs of the necessary chemicals. Right, right. But that suggests that that's how the mechanism works, right? That there's a kind of homeostatic uh, cycle involved in desire that you feel bad and then you feel good and then you feel bad and then you feel good. And you can observe that cycle throughout right. your entire life, right? And you can observe it in people and rats and you know, it can put an electrode in a rat's brain and it makes it feel good when it presses a lever. Mm -hmm. But then it just keeps pressing the lever over and over and over and over again, right? <laughs> yeah, and it messes up the 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 way that the dopamine or whatever it is uh you know, refills. Yeah, no, yeah, but, the but there are differences. Be, there are differences in sensitivity. Lever, right? So it's yeah. never satisfied, right? The point is it, you stimulate the pleasure center directly, it's not gonna satisfy you, it's gonna make you it's going to make you feel good, and then later you're going to want to do it again and again and again. Right. Yeah. So anyway. But I'm, but that, this, I think that means, though, that not this mechanism is just deterministically then bound to give us ultimately a kind of neutral state. It's that this – knowing that the mechanism operates in a certain way means we can – 
change our behaviors in a way that comports with the mechanism. So instead of just uh, pressing the lever a bunch of times and desiring that, we instead learn to be satisfied with our given circumstance, to like have occasional pleasures, to look forward. Like there are, there are tricks well, that we can use, I, I think. I would say that, it, it, that if if the rat pressed the lever once and then just went around feeling blissful forever and never did anything else, that would actually falsify what I'm saying. But in, you know, in all these opportunities for it to be falsified, it is not falsified. So I think it is well, evidence for what I'm saying. But okay. it's, it's evidence for the theory. Now it doesn't prove it. I mean, you know, you can't really prove a theory about phenomenology, but it is consistent with all the evidence. Well, what about what about deep states of meditation? Because that operates differently from drugs. It gives people a state of euphoria from self-reporting. But it, it also looks like there are increased rewards as time goes on, like they, when they do brain scans of monks and stuff like that. It doesn't seem like the, this withdrawal mechanism comes into play. It seems rather there are certain things the monk can do to you know self-reflect and meditate and or pray and experience great pleasure and then you know stop for a bit and then just go right back to it. And there's no withdrawal. There's no diminishing returns. Instead, it gets more with time. Well, I don't know about the monks. I mean, I would imagine that it, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think so. I think probably if the meditation makes them feel good, it probably also makes them feel bad. I think that's just how it works. Um, I, I'm monks saying I are, think that doesn't that doesn't conform to the way what well, a the psychology of monastics like the deeper someone gets in religious practice, the more they want to do their meditation, the more time they spend in meditation. Sure, and, of opiate addicts too, though, right? So maybe they figured a, to out... A point, to right, a point. To a point. And then you get like, the diminishing returns. The difference is it's not diminishing returns. It's greater returns with time. I, I just don't buy it. I'm sure that they're going through withdrawal just like the opiate addict does. It's, it's a less intense pleasure, for sure. Well, and, and meditation yeah, is... It's an empirical, an empirical claim that you're making, and we can look at like dopamine levels over time and these well, some studies have been done what i'm but. okay what i'm claiming is a theory of subjective experience so it's not exact it's empirical but it's not empirical in the same way that a claim about ocean acidity is empirical like there's no way to sample subjective experience and there's no way to even add up your own because um, you don't have access to it once it's gone. Well, I mean, whether we believe the past exists or not, I don't doesn't really matter to me. There's no way to go back to it for us as subjects. So, but no, I think that's not are, true. I think that's not true because you can predict when someone will ex be experiencing a positive subjective value condition based on brain scans. So imagine a, a experimental context where you have the subject; they're hooked up to some kind of machine that observes well, their brain it, it states. You have a the theory. Assumptions. Yeah. You, yeah, but you can test it. So you have a well, theory I'm saying it about depends, how. I'm saying it depends on assumptions about. I'm not. I'm saying that yeah, there are, there are correlates, right? There are psychological correlates of subjective experience. Right. But I'm saying that you know, obviously, there's no direct. Just like there's no way for the subject to get to the thing in itself. There's also no way for the subject to get into another to get to another subject or to get even to his past uh, self, like. You know, it, it goes it kind of funny because it goes back to the being trapped in your subjectivity cogito problem. But but yeah, there are, I, I'm not saying it's completely unempirical. I'm just saying it's a special kind of claim that is about the nature of subjective experience. So you have to think if you're going to evaluate it, you have to evaluate it theoretically and empirically whenever you evaluate empirically you're making assumptions about how subjective experience relates to whatever you're looking at right but th this is a special pleading for this problem because any inference of causal relations involves the same kind of analysis of correlation so how is this different than any other scientific theory well because if you're correlating two objective things you can measure them both but you have no access to subjectivity. So you can measure a person smiling and you can correlate or measure their self-report and correlate that with uh, a measurement of their you know, dopamine level in the reticular formation or whatever it is. But that's not, going, that's not um, measuring their subjectivity, it's measuring two objective 
things that you can measure. So that's not special pleading. It's just a intrinsic limitation. Um, but, but you anyway, can also so perform. Is... You can exper <laughs> perform the experiment on yourself as well, and not have to deal to... with the self-report. But you, sure, there's, you, there's you another can. line. So this was one line of argument that I wanted to make against this claim. The other is, would it make a difference to you if reincarnation was true? Like, say that you know we accept that your your analysis of motivational structure, but instead of you come into being with zero value initially, you exit being with zero value. Instead, you have an infinite number of successive lives well, and wherever you got in terms of the value structure at the end of one life that had an effect on where you start in the next one well hold on i i don't accept that pain and pleasure are value so to me they're not they're not value at all it just doesn't matter um because that's not what i where i situate value so i i don't think whether you experience pain or pleasure matters at all like, it's just not what I consider to be value. Okay, but definitionally, if I define the moral good action as that which maximizes my pleasure, just mm -hmm. to simplify, if that's how I define morality, then is – could you see how if reincarnation was true and the end state of a life influenced how the next state began that – from that moral perspective of maximizing pleasure, there would be such a thing as, as moral realism and your actions would have serious consequences. Well, I think your actions have serious consequences. I just don't think that the consequences that I'm concerned with are not your subjective experiences. So that there, there are some big differences there, like in, in our value theories, right? Like I situate value in the objective world, like what, or it's a subject object relation. I value that. So it's not like I don't value the value relation to me. It doesn't go out from me and then back into my head. Like I value my pleasure. It is I value this thing in reality. Like I value reproducing. Right. So, and, I, and I would equivocate between the saying I value my reproducing with it pleases me to think about my successful uh, reproduction. I think these are equivalent statements ultimately. Well – it might please you to think about your successful reproduction, but it would also displease you to think about not being successful, and it's an open-ended norm. So having the value of reproduction does not generate pleasure or pain. It just motivates you to do it, right? It generates both pleasure and pain because, you, you yeah. know, you feel, oh, shoot, why do I only have five kids? I need to have more, you know? And that's pain. You know, it's an unpleasant feeling. Or you're like, oh, yay, I had another kid. That's pleasure. Right. And what I'm saying is to say that I value something is to say that it pleases me to either have the experience of it or to think about it or whatever. If I say I do not value or I value something negatively, that's to say that when I encounter this sub, you know, object to my subject, it causes me displeasure. Well, it it, it means – okay, well, I, I don't know if I fully agree. There is an emotional component to value, but – Value to me is, an, is a representation of uh, – it's a representation that motivates you. So, yeah, it generates those emotions. It generates both pleasure and pain. If you value something – like let's say you're just playing a chess game or something like that. So when you get into that state of mind, you're motivated to win the game, right? So you're going to act to do things to win the game. You're going to think harder. That's going to be somewhat painful. If you lose, you're going to experience pain. If you win, you're going to experience pleasure. The value of I want to win the chess game or you know, valuing that outcome generates those feelings, but it is not the feelings themselves. It is this idea, and that idea is linked to the will. That's how the will works, right? The will takes translates ideas into emotions. Like the will is like talk, you know, you can have emotions translating into ideas or like, you know, somebody pokes you with a pin and you go, ouch, and why the fuck are you poking me with a pin? But you can have it the other way where you have an idea. I want to, you know, conquer the world or something or I want to win a chess game or I want to have another child. And then that motivates you to act. The idea then motivates you and the idea generates the emotion toward that goal and 
it generates negative and positive emotions toward that drive you toward that goal. Right. So and it is just... not the feelings. It is the idea and its relation. It's, it's the valence of the idea, the 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 potency of that, that yeah, idea it's sort of like to what elicit it's... attraction or repulsion. Right, and right. It's what the... it's doing in your head, right? It's yeah. doing this job in your head of generating these emotions toward it. Right, and I, I say that is exactly what pleasure is. Like saying that an idea in my mind, a representation that I entertain, uh, I value it, is to say that having it before my mind causes me some positive uh, experience, mm, some no, 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 it doesn't, though. Let's say you want to win the chess game. That doesn't give you any pleasure. It's only the winning of the chess game, the objective reality of winning it, your perception that I have won it. This thing in reality has happened. Reality now matches the idea. Yeah, That's exactly. No, but but uh, simulating the win, simulating the win in your mind is what motivates you to go and pursue that actual concretization, right? But you only Being feel able- good when you win. No, I think you sample what it would – you are able to sample what it would feel like if I would win, and you see that, oh, that that makes me feel good. You do it because you think it's going to make you feel good. But if and, that's all you – if I thought that's all you needed, you wouldn't play the game, right? You would just sample it forever and be like, oh, like the rat pressing the lever. Oh, this feels yeah. good to just imagine winning. No, you got to win the game. Yeah, I know, because you can't – I mean, it obviously, empirical experience, you know, real-life experience is much more powerful – than our imagination if it was the case that we could be satisfied just by pleasant images or like if our imagination was super powerful then basically we would like keep ourselves in a kind of simulation of reality perpetually and right. get all of our we, no, uh, rocks off that way but we'd that doesn't be work brain, yeah we'd be brains in vats <laughs> in our skulls we wouldn't actually do anything yeah so right but that's the point of it right the mechanism is there not to make you feel good it's there to make you win the game It's there to make you act in the real world, to change the real world. And to me, that is value. It is the change in the real world that you accomplish that has the value. And you have this idea in your head. You value that outcome. And then your will acts Mm -hmm. to bring it about. But to say you value that outcome, I I don't think it's possible to value an outcome unless – contemplating the idea like whatever it is that you value contemplating the representation of it must give you some pleasure or else you don't value it well it gives you pleasure and pain because the pain is that that oh i'm not winning the game there's a distance between the goal and reality right so that has to you have to be motivated to close the gap between the idea and reality yeah and the That's motivator the there is the pain right well, the mo- the pain is is part of the motivation is 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 motivation, but the pain is an experience of that, of being in that state or of having that motivation arise, you know. So like let's say you're playing a game of soccer, which is a bit more interesting than chess because it goes back and forth. Let's say you're playing the game, you score a goal, that feels good, because yeah, you're closer to the the goal of winning the game. Then the other team scores a goal, that feels bad, right? And so you can go back and forth. You know, feeling good, feeling bad, you know, and there are little feelings along the way, like you're motivated to make a good pass, you're motivated to deke somebody out or whatever. And so all of those little things give you little bits of pleasure and pain along the way. Um, But it's not like the thing the the value doesn't just give you pleasure or just give you pain. It generates the motivation to act in the world, to bring it about. And that's the point of it. Right. That's the purpose of it. That's. To me, value is purpose. It's like, you know, doing things in reality. We are machines that act in the world. Um, so I, I'm not a hedonist. I don't think that the purpose of the machine is to act into its self and feel good. I think the I think this is a means ends confusion. The feeling is there to drive the machine, right? Or it's sort of a side effect, a conscious experience of the process of. Uh, accomplishing the goals like doing the things that you're motivated to do but let's not beat this to death because this is a whole other can of worms and i'm afraid we're never going to get to morality Um, well this is this is morality though isn't it well not to me no 
But so maybe that's, I mean, maybe that is a difference, but. Yeah, I, I blend all of these things together. And you might understand my position better if, you know, you bear in mind that for me, like desire and uh, repulsion are exactly the same thing as attraction and repulsion in physical systems. They're, they're one and the same. So the motive force, the thing that moves the electron towards the proton is uh, exactly that attraction that we experience that actually does move us in in our psychology mm -hmm. yeah i would just distinguish i mean maybe there's a little bit of a hang up here on whether this attraction is pleasure or pain or something else and i would say it's something else i would say motivation is what you call attraction and the pleasure and pain are, are side effects of motivation like moving well, closer to the thing makes you feel good moving further away makes you feel mm -hmm. bad the attraction is like uh, kind of like the force in physics, whereas the good and bad feelings are like uh, work or energy, like movements along the line of force. So that that's a bit of a maybe that's a bit of a difference. But but so let, let me just ask you a question about your concept of objective morality, and maybe it'll bring us back to this because. Um, I think it was in your, I don't know if it was in your lock video or your comments video that you said something like, if you don't, if somebody doesn't believe in objective morality, then you can't trust them. Right. And so, yeah, can you expand on that? Like, what? Well, what's your thinking there? Like, if someone believes that ultimately nothing makes a difference, that no, no one outcome is better or worse than another, then they, you can't really hold them down to any given commitment because they have no reason, there's no rational justification for them keeping to it. If they think it makes no difference whatsoever in terms of it's better or worse to, to break the agreement. Okay, to be, so to be bound by an agreement is to implicitly accept that, uh, you know, abiding by it is better than not abiding, abiding by it. If you don't accept that things are really better or worse, then you can't rationally be held to an agreement. Well, but but it, there's better or worse, and then there's objectively better or worse. I yeah. mean, I guess and what I mean there is that it's objectively, subjectively better. That, and, and by that I mean that you can have a true theory of subjective value that uh, is at the same time intersubjective because it it applies to subjects generally and not just one given subject. Um, it might apply to subjects generally, but that wouldn't make the judgments objective, right? Like, let's say most subjects want, well, let's just make it kind of simple. Let's say that the subjects are little machines that consume glucose and they, they all want glucose. So that's sort of an objective value or, you know, it's, it's one of, it's not really an objective value, but it's, it's a generally true statement about these machines but they they have to compete for the glucose so an, a certain outcome where one gets you know uh, gets a molecule of glucose is good for that or good for that box bad for the other box right i mean this is the condition of nature right that that organisms are pursuing their own interests competing over scarce resources and what is good for one is not good for the others generally right. speaking right so right. there are general statements about value that you could make that you know it is generally subjectively better for for these organisms to have glucose but that doesn't mean that they want the same outcomes they each want the outcome where they get more and the others get less yeah yeah i accept that there there's relativism in value and certain like my value may be incompatible with yours but as far as can I trust someone who doesn't accept that these value structures uh, are <laughs> objective and not arbitrary? Because I guess you want to distinct, distinguish there between two varieties of nihilism. One variety of nihilism is essentially moral relativism, where like I have my value, but it's not ultimately grounded in anything other than my preference. And I care about my value. And I even believe perhaps that my value is determined by physical principles, by physical law, and so is objective in that sense. Uh, 
versus a kind of nihilism that says it ultimately doesn't matter what I do because there's no such thing as good and bad because there's no such thing ultimately as value. And, and so I can just do whatever and it won't make any difference and to the latter type. How can they be held to any agreement? Well, they don't, ha- they don't have rational self-interest because they don't think interests are rational in the first place. Well, I suppose, first of all, a value nihilist, somebody who believed that there are no, like, let's say they reject value. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how they would reject it or in what sense that would be. But they might say that, look, there's no real value, that value is an illusion or something like that, right? Mm-hmm they're still going to act like every other person pretty much, right? So that you could trust them just as much as you can trust anybody else. If, like, right. you're, if you're they, playing a game of no, chess with them... No, no, because you... they can't hold the abstraction. So what, what, what you would have is someone who, in fact, you know, assuming that there is a real structure to value, in fact, they would be motivated by their value, right? They would be motivated by that motivational structure that is inherent in them. But if they don't accept that rationally then you can't convince them that something will be in their self-interest because rationally, or rather like, you know, the proposition they hold in their mind is that no matter what I do, it won't make a difference for, you know, my pleasure and pain. They're not believing in these concepts. It, they will act to seek out their value, but what they won't be able to do is defer immediate gratification because they believe it will be better for them in the long, they can't rationally believe it'll be better for them in the long run because they don't believe in ultimate better or worse. But that doesn't mean though that they won't seek out their immediate gratification uh, well, because but, that, I mean, they're just I, animals in that sense. I, I don't, well, I don't agree that that follows. I think they would be just like everybody else. They would have this philosophical idea that, you know, there's no real value, nothing matters, but they're still going to act like everybody else. And if you present them with a, a chain of reasoning that says, look, if you abide by this agreement, it will be in your self-interest in the long run, then, you know, even though they might say, well, yeah, philosophically, I don't care, they're still going to act as if they care because they do care because they can't get, they can't escape from that condition of subjectivity. You know, they can't just thinking philosophically that nothing matters does not make you stop caring it does not erase your emotions your motivations your values any of those things but i I don't if the strength of the philosophical belief is strong enough to override the expectation of a future state like if the rational world of your belief is more potent to you psychologically than the kind of imaginary world of your hypothetical futures then you really could stop caring about your long run well-being because you don't believe that it matters or that it's even possible for it to be one way or the other it's true that you can't such a person can't stop caring because that's built into their their psychological makeup but they'll be restricted to caring about the kinds of things that are not mediated propositionally that are just kind of a direct animal response but i don't think that's i well i don't know i I don't think that's true maybe it's not that important but it doesn't seem to me like that's going to be the case because they have no reason not to not not to keep the agreement, right? So they're, you know, just because they don't philosophically believe in it, they're still going to think they're well, automatically. What, what binds them to it? What binds them to that agreement? Well, what binds anybody to an agreement? It's just Ex- their expectation of expectation of punishment. Well, right? if you don't yeah, believe in yeah. punishment, then that is not a credible threat. Yeah, but they do believe in punishment in in the sense that matters for them in the, in that context. I think I don't think they're they they may not believe philosophically that being punished matters, but that doesn't mean that they can you know sit there and poke themselves with a pin or that they could you know set a time bomb to explode three hours in the future just because they say that philosophically they don't care what happens, right? They're still gonna you know, they might set the time bomb and then, oh shit, what am I thinking? No, no, no. I <laughs> think they're not going to do it, right? It's, I, I, well, I think they're going to act like pretty much everybody else acts because they have no reason not to, and that is going to be their natural disposition. Mm. 
Well, uh, that would that would imply then that philosophical beliefs have no impact on what a person does. And I, don't, I just don't think that's true. No, I don't think that's true. I'm not saying philosophical beliefs have no impact, but I don't think they have. I don't think this negative belief, which is just a rejection of value, is going to have an impact because it has no positive. It makes no positive claims. It's possible that okay, look, it could have some sort of impact in a way, right? It could be that 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 sort of person just doesn't do make any long-term decisions. It is possible if if they don't have any value, philosophical value, that they might sort of wander around and feel like life is pointless or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I don't think. I mean, I've experienced that myself for about a year, so. I guess it's it's kind of half true and half false, but it's it's not as simple as well. I mean, it's not like our decisions begin from philosophical, uh, uh, begin with philosophical theories. That's not how we make decisions. But we can use philosophy to critique and um, basically to become aware of ourselves and to some extent to control ourselves. So philosophy does feed back into what we do. It does have an yeah. effect on us, but it's not like just because well, somebody, you know, yeah. becomes a value nihilist that they just, you know, become a completely random actor in the world kind of But thing. to be logically consistent with their value nihilism, they might as well be a completely random actor, right? So the when, when you can trust a value nihilist to stick to an agreement is when they're not acting consistently with their value nihilism. And I think you're no, right, because, though, that people don't because evolution has programmed us to accept that there are real good outcomes and real bad outcomes. And so we seek out, you know, what we anticipate to be good outcomes. But to the extent that a person is acting rationally consistent with the idea that nothing matters, uh, you can't hold them to any given course of action because it doesn't matter to them if they're being consistent, whether they hold to it or not. Well, I would say that it's 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 logic. Anything is logically consistent with the claim that nothing matters because if nothing matters every action is equally acceptable so there's nothing wrong with keeping the agreement philosophically but but you can't expect them to right that's why you can't trust them it's from your perspective viewing them yeah they may happen to keep it there's no it's not logically inconsistent for them to keep it but it's logically inconsistent for them to be expected to keep it what what's missing the i guess the only difference is that they do not have a philosophical reason to keep it but they might have other right. psychological reasons to keep it, which I think is but what. If, if you have a well-ordered worldview, I, I think those blend together. Well, like the way that philosophy feeds into a motivational structure for me is that to motivate ourselves towards a, a certain future, we idealize that future, and in that sense, we model it. And the way that we model it can uh, conforms to the theory that we have of the world in the broadest sense. And so. For me, that would entail a whole metaphysical scheme, including the like the metaphysical status of good and bad. And that also includes like the projections we might make karmically of what sorts of things will lead to positive value and negative value in the future. And all of that uh, philosophical system is in the background structuring the way that I idealize a given future. Right. If I'm being consistent in anticipating the future and then I will aim towards futures that in the full light of the the philosophical theory or system give me then a greater sense or anticipation of pleasure i pursue those options whereas if i didn't have my philosophical theory i definitely wouldn't care about you know asceticism i definitely wouldn't care about trying to avoid you know carnal pleasures or avoid like swear words or, or certain things like i my motivations will change based on my philosophical system because the philosophical system ultimately is what determines the the model of the future that I have. Right. Well, I would say it gives you this overarching theory. So you have – like most people go through lives without any philosophical system because they just go through their lives uh, taking things one frame at a time, one little chunk at a time, Right. Mm-hmm. They they don't think on a large scale. They don't think about their lives. They don't think about, you know, when they're when they're thinking about whether something is true or false. They're not thinking about it epistemologically. They're just thinking about what did I see or what did I, what did I hear? Or what do the authorities say or whatever? So philosophy adds a layer above that, which is more abstract, which is more, which can be a unifying th- 
theory of belief, um, but it is still just a layer above it. It's not I mean, people don't start out with it. It's something you add as you grow intellectually, if you ever get to that point. Sure. Yeah. Um, OK, but well, that is a little bit different from what I thought you meant, though, because. No, no. Get, granted that you have a powerful philosophical system and powerful, I just mean psychologically, it will impact the way that you project your futures and therefore it will impact your motivational structure. So if you are yes. consistent with nihilism when you anticipate futures, the way that you create the model of the future will be value neutral itself. Uh, if you're going to be totally consistent. Yeah. Well, at that level, you could make no judgments. But then there would still be right. the judgments at the lower levels anyway. So I'm, th- I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So but, you would be restricted to animal kinds of preference and you would just do well, whatever you immediately wanted to do because you can't have rational long term goals. I, I don't know. Maybe you could have long term goals that you just say, well, what the heck? I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to have a, a house with a white picket fence and whatever. <laughs> I don't know that you couldn't. There's no reason why you couldn't just say, OK, this is rationally consistent with everything being meaningless. I'll just, you know, have well, a house. The, and five the, kids goal, and the, keep goal all my itself, and, the goal itself can't be rational in that there's a reason for you to pursue it. The, the, there's, there's no reason not to. But that's different than it being rational in the sense that. I would use the term rational to mean that any given thing has a reason for its being. And if your motivation or your goal has no reason for being, then that's irrational. Yeah. At the highest level, it is contingent. And so like the the nihilist has that indeterminacy at the highest level. Right. That freedom, in a sense, that um, that we were talking about before, that indeterminate bit that if they, they could choose to break the agreement and they don't have any basis for making that ultimate judgment yeah right um, which is why yeah. i would say you can't trust them because they're they're too free they're not constrained enough yeah well maybe that's and that's kind of that gets back to sort of interesting contrast and an interesting problem within liberalism right that you can't trust people who are free, who are free right um at least if they're too free yeah which means that the kind of person who's capable of being free but who doesn't submit to reason, like the etiquette of reason in that like anything that I believe is going to necessarily have a ground. Um, it, someone who's too, for like the chaotic rogue state actor, like the liberal community will have to just suppress the dictator because they're obviously too free. Like they, they're capable of being liberal, but they're not playing the same kind of game as the mm-hmm. rest of the liberals. And so they have to be shunned. I just before I forget, I was going to say, and then I forgot to mention it, that I whether I agree with you or not about the current situation of the world, whether it matches this idea of a high, like a liberal elite or not, I think that is an ideal to strive toward, which is a rational elite governing a sort of hierarchy of, you know, higher rational rationality or greater rationality ruling over lower rationality. Right. I don't think I don't I'm not so sure we have that, but I, would, I think that's something we could strive toward. But yeah. I just, we that's have just an maybe aside. an aspect of it or part of it, something that wants to be that. But yeah, yeah. Okay, but um, so what I thought you meant though when you said that was more. So when people say objective morality, usually what they mean is something like moral realism that there are imperatives that are built into, well. I don't know what logic or nature or something like that. And so people are not free. Right. Uh, they're sort of bound by these imperatives. And there are very select imperatives that, so like I said, like, like I believe that there's a structure to subjective value and that it's intersubjective in that all, because ultimately I believe in kind of a soul universalism or Atman so that all, like my subject is ultimately the same as your subject. So the kinds of like propositional moral statements that actually are universal imperatives are restrained to something like Kant's categorical imperative, like you should act according to that maxim that you would have universalized in you know, similar things. Whereas a, an imperative like thou shalt shall not kill, like that's not going to be able to be consistent in the kind of relativistic moral realism that I would hold to. 
Okay, and and so right, so a lot of moral principles would not come out of your system, but some kind of high level principle might. But so that I guess the other question is, how could you trust somebody? Like, first of all, nobody really, no, well, not nobody, but almost nobody has your philosophical system, right? I mean, that's a fair thing to say, right? Well, but, yeah, I mean, all the Hind, all Advaita Vedanta Hindus have something arbitrarily close to my system. Okay. Well, then people are around you, generally speaking, are not, you know, they don't agree with your system. They don't. They, they don't even have any. I don't even think most Hindus would have this idea that you have. Like, they would have a much simpler, more kind of mythical understanding, right? They're not going to have this like epistemologically grounded, uh, you know, metaphysics or whatever. I don't know what yeah, the mo- word is. Yeah, probably, the, probably not. Yeah, they're they're going to have some more intuitive understanding, right? So. Very few people are going to have your philosophical theory. Um, so, like, and, and in what sense do they accept your moral theory then if they don't actually, like, have it in their heads? What do you mean to what accept to they? I mean, they don't well, accept my moral theory I, philosophically, but... Well, I mean, I don't think most people have ever thought about whether morality is objective or subjective or anything like that. They just have certain – they've been trained certain ways. They have moral intuitions that are based on how they were raised and the society that they live in. Like, So my view of morality is people absorb the, the rules of the environment. They internalize the power structure of the environment, and that's what morality is. It's right. – it's, an in a sort of false internalization of it and so you perceive it as emanating from within you or as emanating from the cosmos or something like that when in fact it's the social environment so you've learned that oh i'll get punished for these things i'll get rewarded for these things you acquire moral intuitions based on punishment reward yeah and also explicit teaching and instruction and all this stuff but you never think about it you don't have any theory of what it is you just take for granted that there are good things and bad things and i would say moral values are not the same as for for most people anyway they do not feel them or experience them as equivalent to personal values like um like personal preferences people will often contrast preferences with moral values yeah, like right? I like, want to do this, but I know I should do that. Something yeah, like that. exactly. So there, there's a contrast. They're, they're explicitly distinct because one of them comes from the social environment and the other comes from within you, comes from your evolved desires, your evolved right. emotions. Now, of course, the social environment interacts with your emotions, which is what gives them, ultimately gives moral intuitions their force, you know, that you you have been punished and rewarded in the past. You've, you know... So you fear punishment. So ultimately, they have to be grounded in your emotions to have any effect on you. But people don't have that theory. They believe that they are doing certain things because they are good versus bad people and that there are good and bad actions. Right. And that's just the way it is. And they don't have any real theory about these things. So I guess they have an object. They're naive moral realists, right? They have some notion that things are out there. That morality is like out there, but they don't have any. They never thought about it. They don't have any theory of why it's out there, what it is, etc. Usually, yeah. I mean, Christians will generally believe that it all comes from God. That God makes some things good and some things mm. not good. Um, but I don't disagree with the kind of sociological characterization of morality that you're giving. I just think that they're mistaken in abstracting good and bad too far away from their preferences. And I think it's telling that. A Christian identifies all those good actions as those which will ultimately lead him to heaven. So when he says, I want to do this, but I should do that, he means practically, even if he doesn't realize it, that short term, I I would feel happy if I got this. But long term, I know I would be happier doing that that would get me into heaven. Okay, so and, and in that case, then, in what sense is it objective? Because it's objectively true that doing that instead of this will lead to my long-term 
happiness. But only if you believe in heaven and all these other things. Well, yeah, I mean, because I believe in reincarnation. I also technically, I mean, in a sense, I do believe in heavens, like something like that, which just follows, like, I believe the the universe is infinite. I think that's the most parsimonious uh, account of reality as a whole, um, which, again, goes back to that, like, neoplatonic conception of the ultimate uh, in uncontingent being, necessary being, um, but that's a whole different discussion. But anyway, if you have unlimited... Uh, lifespan, if you're immortal, essentially, then the long run has the potential of, of causing far greater suffering uh, or far greater reward than any immediate outcome in this life. And so it's objectively true that we should do the sorts of things that Christians basically intuit that we should do because of the, the theory of reincarnation that I have, the theory of how value works, how you know, what sorts of things actually are rewarding to a person in the long run. And I think that moving away from pursuing objects of desire and moving towards contemplation of truth, so basically meditation and prayer, that that's ultimately what leads to the best states in the long run and that and that, that is objectively true. Um. Okay. Well, it... it Setting aside whether it's objectively true, it's not something that most people believe, right? So they don't have – I mean they might believe some of it, but they're not going to have your view of this system, right? That they're not going to – I'm just not – so if you say objective morality, what you really mean is subjective self-interest, but this enlightened self-interest that is enlightened by this – metaphysical system right yeah well it's that subjective self-interest is law law law-like there's a law to self-interest that itself is objective and that's basically saying so what i'm saying is like karma is real so moral realism is saying there's such a thing as karma and knowing the way that karma works is is actually going to be good for you how could you know the way karma works well, yeah, that involves like the metaphysics of value, which Schopenhauer gives some of those arguments relating to desire. And it's it echoes a lot of what you were saying regarding like the necessary ups and downs of pursuing objects of desire. But there's something different than that. You don't have to pursue objects. You can also pursue the inner being of the subject through contemplation, and the active cessation of desire through uh, contemplative meditation, mindfulness. Mm. So that's like the I don't know getting into like how you can know how karma works. That's it, it involves a, a whole system clearly. Uh, part of it is inductive though. Part of it is just from viewing a bunch of cases and, and extrapolating trends and you know extrapolating causal uh, factors like when a person does things that uh, have harmful impacts on others, they tend to encounter harmful things themselves. Uh, but then you can also make metaphysical arguments for that sort of thing. I mean, one of the the only real formal arguments I have in that regard would be the kind of statistical argument for karma that I've I've given in the past, which is that uh, because you are more likely to find yourself in a context where your kind is uh, in greater abundance. Um, this is like the statistics of crowds, where if you go to the bank, you're more likely to be in the bank when a lot of people are in the bank than when only a few people are in the bank. Um, so if if I abide by some principle, I am more likely, statistically, more likely to be around in general beings that abide by that principle than than you know the opposite. So there's a kind of statistical law that whatever type you embody you gravitate towards that type well the not necessarily because of the effect of selection i mean like let's say that your principle embodies um jumping off buildings well Mm -hmm. for a brief moment you might be around other people jumping off buildings you know but most most people are like that that thing doesn't work right so it's it's that you're going to be around people not just who might embody a type, but who, for whom that, um, that way of life works. 
right? So I and and a way of life that involves competing with others is obviously well, competition is built into nature. So uh, immorality, in in a, some sense, is built into nature. Like nature is not moral in the way most people think of morality. Uh, lions don't make deals and keep them. They don't have yeah, social right. contracts. They they fight over mates. They fight over food. They rip the guts out of zebras. They, you know, the, and then they do all those things because it works, right? So right. In, in that sense, there are local maxima to, or minima to different uh, types existing in in a given region. Like there there are certain environmental factors that yeah will mean that you won't encounter like altruistic people in an evolutionary context but the whole idea is between lifetimes we're concerned about this process and so in an infinite cosmos there are those worlds out there that are governed by rationality strictly that have overcome or overcame the kind of evolutionary darwinian pressures of a unregulated kind of more or less chaotic world uh, so those are the heavens that you want to encounter, which is why if you act mm. rationally and altruistically, you're more likely to incarnate into one of those worlds full of altruistic beings, rational, altru- the angelic beings. But wait, how how does that make you more likely to incarnate into those worlds? This kind of statistical gravitation. So if I, you know, I abide by this maxim of being altruistic, where those beings that find themselves or those beings that are altruistic tend to find themselves cosmically where they are in greater greatest abundance. That's just a general principle. If there, if things are clustered in reality and there are massive clusters and there are isolated scatterings, if you're of that type, you're more likely to find yourself in the large cluster than the isolated scattering. Well, I don't know that that's like a general. Pr- I mean, I don't. I don't really understand it because I don't know what the causal mechanisms are of this metaphysics. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's it's not a causal uh, mechanism at all, really, strictly speaking. It's uh, because. Well, I mean, like <laughs> if people people who like like say you know punk music will be more likely to come together at the punk club because there is a cause of getting them together. <clears throat> um, herbivores that eat grass will go to where grass is, but they'll also spread out because as they consume the grass, they'll deplete it, and so they'll move around and, you know, uh, then they won't just all clump up in one place. Uh, altruists will get selected against, so they will not be where altruists are. They simply won't exist. Yeah, well, uh, if, the, if the universe is infinite, though, there are worlds out there that have transcended the evolutionary condition, and all of the beings in that world are rational agents who acknowledge this kind of... It's obviously presupposing the truth of the system to, to say this, but all of them understand these dynamics of karma, understand the value of meditation, and so they, they, they aren't selected against in that world because in that world, rash, reason ultimately has won out. So you Whereas believe that. Here. So you believe that this there's some kind of attractive force that will bring these different consciousnesses together in a in the same place. And it's it's again it's not causal attract attraction. It is that types. It's more just. It, I don't know. I'd have to get into like the theory of ideas and and time, you know, time is supposed to be an illusion in in my system anyway. And so the association of types is always on the basis of analogy of similarity of the fact that things can fit together. Causality is necessitated because you have a super abundance of types available and for any given thing, there will necessarily be something that fits the bill of the reason for its being what it is, because those things are abundant. But here we're, we're starting to get into like really a whole different discussion okay. and we shouldn't begin it. But but yeah, that's ultimately why I think there can be objective moral principles that there's basically a truth to the way karma works and that karma is the moral realism I'm talking about. Okay. Well, I just, but I, I guess my hang up on this thing is that, well, I mean, one is I don't believe it, but the other is that, uh, that nobody else believes it. So because nobody else believes it, you're, you're not around people like yours, yourself. 
Um, like, I don't think the supermarket believes in karma and that's why they keep the, you know, why they don't put poison in the food or whatever. It's because there are incentives and, right. uh, well, I, so I think you I was, trust people based on the incentives in the local environment. I don't think you, you have to worry too much about their philosophical or metaphysical assumptions. Yeah, largely when people are animalistic, yeah, but when you know that someone has a strong belief, you can anticipate that they're going to act in accordance with that belief. Like if I know someone is a real, devout, believing Christian, then I then I know when I'm in trouble, I can probably ask them for altruistic help and they'll likely give it to me because I understand that their belief mechanism is going to alter their motivation to do so. Well, <laughs> I guess, but I don't know. Like, I just don't. I mean, look, you, you get the SJW saying, uh, you know, let everybody into the country, but they would never let somebody stay in their house. It, right. You know, I mean, people believe all kinds of things in different ways, and the hypocrisy to me seems to go hand in hand with morality because we are self interested, so morality almost necessitates hypocrisy. You're going to pretend that you're good, but you're not going to really be good, and if you can dodge dodge around it you'll do that but you might you might do it in a way that doesn't expose your hypocrisy to yourself and uh i don't know well, like, to me i trust people because of incentives basically and also because of self-interest if i know that the other person has the same interest as me like if we're in a boat and we're both trying to row for the shore to get there alive then there's not much reason to not trust them right Unless they are irrational. If someone's crazy, True. they can't have that long-term goal. So, oh, yeah. No, 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 I agree. You have to know that their interests are well, – yeah, you have to have some idea of what their interests are, what they're trying to do. And Their interests and their beliefs because they may have the interest right. in, in rowing to shore, but they don't believe that it will help them because they can't formulate rational propositions about the future. So. Right, right. But, okay, well, it's – are you – I'm getting the sense you're – getting a bit tired and it's probably kind of late We've it's not gone. too late but I, I need to get ready for yeah. some stuff later on but okay yeah so let's wrap it up We've, yeah no it was a really good talk it's just sort of it's, it's kind of rambling so <laughs> we're <laughs> opening up so many different issues so maybe yeah we can always continue it some other time uh yeah what really has to be like sorted out to get at some of these differences is the underlying metaphysics so you'd have to basically like confront the whole question of Platonism, uh, which is kind of the basis of this this whole system, mm-hmm. but maybe yeah, at some like point Platonic in the epistemology. You mean the is that what you mean? Like the th- the theory of um, you know ideals or ideas existing independent of minds and reality. Um, well, yeah, but it, it's grounded in. And this is kind of tricky with Plato because it's not in the dialogues explicitly. It's what would be called like a hidden teaching of Plato's. And Aristotle mentions it explicitly in his writings, uh, saying that Plato believed this. But it's really derived from Pythagoras. Uh, but it's this notion that the the ultimate nature of reality is one and that all differences flow out of first the kind of archetypes of the limited and the unlimited and then uh, it's kind of a pseudo mathematical exposition out of this basic principle of of oneness or identity. And th- there are different mythological ways that this kind of spinning out from the undifferentiated occurs, but it's pretty universal. And you, you can see it echoed even in mythological systems that aren't explicitly philosophical, like in Egyptian mythology. The first mm. god is like the god of depth. And, and I think that depth is this kind of like murky waters that were there before creation in the Bible. So that, again, mm. there, usually you have mythological expositions of this idea, but my interpretation of it is in mathematical terms. It's mathematical reductionism, where that thing that that's ultimately the center of everything or that is everything in totality is simply something like the bit in information systems, something purely undifferentiated, a just raw presentation of its identity i am that i am so there it's hard to talk about this stuff without going mythological but i kind of hold out hope that we'll have a rationalistic way of articulating it that will provide a kind of paradigm for the sciences this is chris langan's hope as well is chris langan i've heard the name before is he like a christian 
like apologetics guy or something like that. Um, I mean, he's compatible with Christianity as well, but he's just a metaphysician, I guess is the best word for it. Reality theorist. He calls what he does reality theory, you know, theory of reality okay. as a whole. But he he's famous because he has like the highest IQ in the U.S. That's why. Oh, OK. I've heard. Yeah, I've heard the name before, but I, I don't know where to place it. OK. Do you uh, do you have any specific like video on metaphysics that you would recommend from your to uh, present your views, your metaphysical views from the beginning? Is there like one? Not really. Not succinctly. No, the no. best thing would be the metaphysics of the perennial philosophy series that I made. It's like five or six videos and probably a few hours mm. altogether. But it's not it's not succinct and it's kind of messy and sloppy because I, I just kind of did it extemporaneously and drew illustrations. And one day I'd like to make a, a more succinct presentation. But if you wanted to read Langan, uh, you would want to go to the CTMU cognitive theoretic model of the universe it's floating okay. around online, but uh, yeah, I would go to Langan to have like strictness in a metaphysical system. Okay, so his metaphysics are related to yours, or yeah, they're basically yeah. the same. There, okay. there are some, there are a couple details in his system that I don't fully understand, to be honest. Uh, like the concept of um, what is it, C- conspansion? This is like a way that he sees kind of time unfolding where the, at the same time it is an inflation of space but also a shrinking of objects and it's this seems like it comes out of left field for me and I, I can't contextualize it in the rest of his system but there are other principles that he mm. brings out and the whole method i, I appreciate um it's a, a form of idealism but anyway i mean if you can unfortunately there's not a lot of secondary literature on langan although he's kind of growing a presence um on facebook and he has some people who are spreading his ideas but okay but yeah. yeah maybe i'll check him out cool all right well yeah it was good talking to you and uh yeah i hope things are going well in your you know ordinary life apart from philosophy uh, yeah what else is there but, but philosophy <laughs> <laughs> it dominates my well i was just thinking about this the other day that i, I probably it, it just keeps coming back you know like every time i'm doing ordinary things it sort of pops up in the background keeps drawing you back in but yeah Anyway, take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye.